Friday, September the 2nd. And I believe I'm speaking with Mr. James Kelly. That's correct. Mr. James Kelly of Athens, Georgia. Correct. Oh, gosh, there's one thing I haven't done. Mr. James Kelly of Athens, Georgia. Mr. Kelly, can you tell me something of your experiences during the era of World War II? Well, uh, the day the war started, uh, I was one month shy of being 16 years old. And uh, I heard the news about uh, Pearl Harbor uh, on the radio. I carried morning papers as a kid and uh, usually slept in on Sunday, Sunday, and it was uh, mid-morning or later, as I remember, when uh, uh, radio made the announcement. And uh, after, I was by myself at the house, everybody else was gone. I remember I went downtown and sold uh, newspaper extras on, uh, on the streets as uh, my first activity. Uh, was that the day of Pearl Harbor? Yes. I was, uh, as I said, I was one month shy of being 16. I was uh, only, 50, uh, only 15 years old. Uh, and that last year of uh, uh, my junior year and then senior year in high school was during the war. I, I went ahead and graduated in three and a half years, which you could do at that time. And then when I was uh, 17, uh, three weeks later, I graduated from high school, and then one week later, I went into the uh, Marine Corps, uh, enlisting on the 29th day of January, 1943. I lived in Evansville, Indiana. That was where I was born and raised, went to high school. Uh, we were, two of us, were sent by bus from Evansville to Louisville, Kentucky, which was the enlistment center. And I was actually sworn in then on the 29th, as I said, of January in Louisville. Uh, they put us on a train to go to boot camp. There were, I think, about 35 or 40 of us that had been assembled there at that one spot to be uh, processed. Uh, we thought we were on our way to Paris Island, South Carolina, which was a normal situation. The Marine Corps, by and large, sent people east of the Mississippi to boot camp to Paris Island, west to uh, San Diego. Uh, we rode the train overnight, uh, it had a Pullman. <clears throat> when we woke up, looked out the window, it was snowing, so we knew that something had happened. And it was only then we found out that we were on our way to San Diego and not Paris Island. We were told, and I don't remember who told us uh, later on, that the reason for that was that they had a meningitis outbreak at Paris Island and it had been closed for a few weeks. And that is the way we went to San Diego. Uh, having done that, then the furthest east I ever got uh, during the time in service was uh, Norman, Oklahoma. Uh, I went to there to a, to a training school. I went to boot camp in, in San Diego. Uh, finished that up, I guess, and would have been in late March. Uh, spent a week on mess duty, which uh, you sometimes drew there at the Marine Corps base in San Diego. Uh, from there I was sent to uh, a, a place called Marimar, Camp Marimar. Actually at the time we went out there it was called Kearney Mesa and they changed the name to Marimar, I never did understand that, but it was purely and simply a casual center. It was for assigning and reassigning people when you went in marine aviation on the west coast pretty much any time you were transferred you went through Marimar. And uh, <clears throat> we took a battery of tests, and uh, I had had a pretty good high school background in mathematics, so I scored very well on the mathematics test, and they segregated about 20 of us out of four, three or 400 uh, who had uh, done well on those scores and kind of gave us our choice of what we wanted to do. I ran into difficulty because I was only 17, and uh, many of the jobs that uh, otherwise I might have uh, wanted to take. Uh, I could not take because I was uh, too young. Uh, with that being the case, uh, uh, well, back up. Uh, two of the things I thought I might want to do was to be a weatherman or a control uh, tower operator. Neither of those jobs were open to 17-year-old. 
So I, I, my next choice, I wanted to be a torpedo expert. And the reason for that was that the torpedo school was at Great Lakes in Chicago, and that would have sent me close to home. So uh, the, the uh, captain who was in charge of that said, okay, that's fine. But uh, the Marine Corps didn't need many torpedo experts. The only ones they needed were the few that worked with uh, uh, TBM squadrons with torpedo bomber, and there were relatively few of those. So I sat around Miramar for uh, well over a month uh, doing absolutely nothing, uh, getting up and policing the area and so forth, uh, going to San Diego uh, every night when we could afford it, uh, waiting to be assigned. And finally, after that time, we were called back together and told that we, there would be no openings in torpedo school. And what did I want to do then? And the, for reasons I never will understand, I uh, just had to do something was uh, I went to uh, what's called ordnance school and that was to train you to um, arm and prepare and maintain uh, aircraft machine guns and uh, a 20 millimeter cannon and, and that type of thing. Uh, that school, the one I was assigned to was at uh, Norman, Oklahoma and it was uh, in Oklahoma, Norman they call it North Base and South Base. South Base was just south of the university campus. We had nothing to do with the university, just to, that it was next door. Uh, the, the, that school lasted about, as I remember, 12 weeks, maybe only eight. Uh, and they ran two shifts. You got started, they had uh, six until one, and one that ran from, I'm going to say two until 8.30 or nine. Uh, you alternated, did two weeks at a time. Had double instructors, everything was, was a double. Uh, went through the, spent the summer of 1943 then in Norman. And uh, I think about that quite often, uh, how times have changed because our means of transportation getting from Norman to Oklahoma City was by uh, old inner urban. We rode uh, streetcars. Uh, really, it's what they looked like, what they were really from uh, Norman to Oklahoma City uh, when we went on leave. A streetcar that ran for how many miles? Well, this one, Norman, is only, I guess, maybe 25 or 30 miles, but uh, they had, that was a very uh, frequently used transportation means in those days. There was, uh, later on, I went to school at Baylor in Waco, Texas. And as late as, I think the last day they ran was Christmas Day of 48, but as late as 48, they ran a streetcar from Waco to Dallas, which was 100 miles. And uh, some years ago, the American Heritage Magazine had an article on inner urbans, and uh, uh, they were during the early, early 1900s, and I guess going back sometime into the 1800s, they were a very... Uh, what, what you'd have now would be the, the, like the southeastern bus line that mm -hmm. comes through here. Well, and there would have been an interurban, I'm sure, a, I don't know that they had them here, but where they had them. Uh, for example, in Evansville, I grew up, all the little towns around southern Indiana and even over into Kentucky, they had a, uh, an ur an interurban uh, area, which, and they were replaced by buses, which uh, ultimately have gone out of business because now everybody has an automobile. But uh, I can remember the huge lines down at uh, uh, Norman, uh, at Oklahoma City, uh, of, of people getting on the the uh, streetcar to ride back to uh, to Norman, and then people who lived in Norman would drive by there, when, uh, Oklahoma City visiting or shopping or whatever, would quite often drive by there and then offer to give you a ride because the people uh, really knocked themselves out being. Uh, nice to to everybody. Overall, that was a very enjoyable experience. Uh, uh, Norman was a, a college town, not to reach benefit out of it, but uh, the, one of the other aspects of that thing was that they had a, uh, a dance band. These were all, except for one guy, were the band from the old uh, aircraft carrier Lexington. See the, let me, I, I need to say this, that the base at Norman was actually a naval base. We went through, used their facilities. <coughs> uh, the Navy fed us, 
uh, of course. Uh, now we, the classes we were in were all Marine classes, but there were, at the same time we were going to school in the same business, there would be, I guess maybe eight Navy classes to every Marine class. That was about, I guess, maybe one out of eight, maybe one out of ten. Uh, I'm not sure of that either, but there were predominance of Navy people. But this was a Navy dance band, and they were really good. Mm. And then uh, Tex Beneke, who was the uh, one of the feature performers of the Glenn Miller Orchestra, the Chattanooga Choo Choo, uh, two records that uh, old people will remember as being very popular. He was the vocalist on it. He played sax and had a rather quite unusual voice. I won't say it was a good voice, but it was very distinctive, and he was very, very popular. Uh, he had come into the Navy, and as like a lot of people, when they came with specialties like that, came in with considerable rank, and he was a chief petty officer, not a would be the equivalent of a master sergeant in the Army. And he, he headed up this band. And uh, on Thursday night especially, they'd have huge dances in the uh, big field house arrangement they had, and the girls from the university and from Oklahoma City would come in uh, by the by the bus load. Yeah. And uh, <coughs> it would... Like pardon? Would you like some water or something? Oh, yes, I would, if you... I can do that. Uh, thank you. Uh -huh. Turn this off for a moment. Sure. So having completed the training there at Norman, went back to Miramar uh, and waited there for assignment. And uh, we were there maybe three weeks uh, or to a month. We spent, I spent a lot of time waiting, and I think that's an aspect of the war that a lot of people probably don't understand, but one of the big problems of the war was boredom. And I've always felt like that the book, Mr. Roberts, was the uh, best book to come out of World War II in terms that it was most realistic because it described the hour upon hour and day upon day and week upon week that people spent just going from twiddle down to twiddle dee, I think was the expression he used in that book. Uh, but, the, well, yeah, it became a movie as well, but the, uh, the book, uh, uh, well, here again, was the book better than the movie at the pants? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And Miramar again was that was that San Diego. San Diego. Yeah, it's uh, it's. Uh, I went out there a couple years ago. My grandson and I went out to watch the Braves play and uh, uh, couldn't find it. Save my soul. We drove around for a long period of time. But I talked to some people at the ballpark, and uh, one man and his wife uh, that we talked to for quite a while. They had a young son about the age of my grandson. The two boys were chatting after the ball game and. Uh, she remembered where it was, uh, or knew where it was from the from the geography. As a uh, the the name Kearney Mesa, which was the first name of that thing, meant something to her. But in any event, it was it wasn't uh, had no air fa facilities at all. Just was a whole bunch of barracks with a had a uh, auditorium. Uh, uh, got a lot of entertainment being close to Hollywood. Why uh, a lot of people. Uh, I'm sure wanting to do what they could for the military and for the war effort and USO and whatever, but at the same time it was very easy for them to get a lot of exposure. So there were some real good, uh, fairly well-known people that came down there uh, to put on uh, uh, concerts and shows and whatever. Uh, stayed around there for a little while and then I was assigned to the United States Marine, uh, the Marine Corps Air St Base at uh, Mojave, California, which is a little town up in the desert. It's uh, between Los Angeles and Bakersfield. Uh, the local legend was, and I don't know that this is true, but we were told that it was uh, the field was a uh, leftover from the uh, Prohibition days, that it was a field where uh, whiskey was flown in from Mexico to uh, Southern California. And it was a hundred mile even up to LA, about 65 miles south of Bakersfield. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons that uh, they had, the Marines, Marine Corps had in Southern California four or five uh, fields like that. They were training facilities. You train uh, uh, fighter squadrons and dive bomber squadrons predominantly. Uh, Mojave was considered to be uh, an ideal spot because you got more flying days per year there according to the weather in the country. Again, we were told that. I don't know if that's true or not, but that was the local scuttlebutt, yeah. The only problem was late in the afternoon the wind uh, would get uh, would get rough. But other than that, it was clear, hot, 
uh, dry. Uh, but I was assigned to a, a headquarters squadron, and again, we had absolutely nothing to do. Uh, about once ever three weeks, we would be called upon in my little section to uh, uh, take uh, 50 caliber ammunition and to put it in the, the links that uh, were used to feed through the fighter, uh, the guns in the, in the wings. And this meant that you put them on a machine and they had every fourth or fifth one was a tracer. So one guy put three armor piercing and then the tracer. And so you stood there and did this and we did that for sometimes uh, a half a day, sometimes a day, sometimes a day and a half, but that would be most infrequent. So during that time I <coughs> uh, developed my skills as a uh, casino player and a uh, checker player. I got, uh, we had two guys that were really good checker players and I even went so far as to go to the library and buy books to uh, learn how to play checkers. And uh, then after, we, that was while we were on duty, uh, they had a, a basketball, couple basketball courts in asphalt. Uh, between the, the barracks. There was only, I guess, maybe 300 people on the whole base. There were only, as I remember, six or maybe was eight uh, two-story barracks buildings that would have held, oh, six, seven hundred people at the most. Uh, and they, the bunks were separated. Uh, you, we didn't have a private room or anything like that, but you did have you know, plenty of space. Uh, and the thing about the desert was it was so cold and it was cool at night. You could you could sleep, and then we'd get out and run through the day playing ball and whatever. I mean, in pretty good physical condition. Uh, the other advantage of it was, and it really was an advantage, we were far enough away that you didn't go to town every night. So uh, our routine seemed to be that we would go to Bakersfield one night a week, and then go to uh, uh, Los Angeles. Uh, usually, we settle in Hollywood on uh, Saturday and Sunday. We could get away from, uh, they let us, let us leave by noon on Saturdays, I remember. So we could get to Los Angeles by four or five o'clock, hitchhike nearly always, and hitchhike back. Uh, every once in a while I see in the paper now Lancaster, California, and that sticks in my mind because it's very easy to get a ride back to Lancaster, mm. but getting from Lancaster to Mojave, which was the last I'm going to say 25 or 30 miles, was very difficult. And there was a old-fashioned cafe at the north end of Lancaster, and the man who ran it, and a lot of times it was cold, uh, would let us stay in there because you'd hear cars coming. And we'd sit in there and wait, and we'd hear a truck or a car coming, we'd run out and hitchhike and then come back in. But eventually we always made it. Uh, very few people would pass you up out in the day. Did you ever uh, miss your... your uh, uh, Appointed time to be that. Condition. No, I never did. Uh, now I did on that thing because, as I say, uh, there was enough traffic to take care of. Uh, to take care of. Uh, keep in mind, there was never more than five or six people in there. I mean, this was not a a, a base like uh, Fort Garden or or Benning or anything like this. This was a small uh, base, and uh, then, of course, you had a lot of people, the uh, officers and uh, and some of the senior enlisted men were married and they had uh, there was some housing around there not military housing but housing around there so not everybody went to town so it was not mass exodus anything like that it was just a handful of people and then there was a navy base up uh, further up in the mountains called Inyo Kern uh, and they had quite a bit of traffic uh, going up there and it was not uncommon for uh, a navy officer uh, to be chauffeured up that way and would nearly always stop and uh, graciously fill up their car to, to take us up there rather than, than just pass us by. But I understand Lancaster now is like uh, Los Angeles, that uh, I've, I've never been there, but I've uh, sometimes I'd like to go, but otherwise I think, well, why not? There's other places I'd rather go. But at any rate, I have not been, been back there. So you uh, were there for most of 1943? Uh, I went there in November, see, it was November before I got there, uh -huh. because I spent this other time in, in school, and, and I stayed there until uh, middle of 1944. I got assigned to a fighter squadron, and it was VMF-213, and I noticed in your display downstairs you had VMF-214, but uh, I was in the, uh, the 213 had been 
uh, had been overseas and come back, and I was assigned it. But uh, just before they went overseas, uh, I had cut my ear uh, in a freak accident, and it had infected. And the doctor uh, refused to uh, certify me to go overseas. So I was transferred back into this headquarters outfit from which I came, but I, was, I wasn't there three weeks until the ear was healed. There's no real problem with it. I think the doctor was just overreacting. He didn't want to take anybody overseas that he thought he'd have a trouble with. I can understand that. And certainly the war effort's not going to be helped or hindered whether I went or not. It was not a matter that reached Washington, I'm sure. But I went back to Miramar to be reassigned overseas and ended up beating the outfit I overseas and in fact uh, they never got past Hawaii so if I had not been had not cut my ear I would not gotten any further uh, west than Hawaii they they stayed there and and rode the war out there I ran into some of them after the war was over we went from uh, San Diego left I guess was late October yeah had to be Late, late October 44, uh, on an Army transport uh, from San Diego, we went to Honolulu. Uh, we were in Honolulu when the 44 results were announced. I remember that. They did not let us off the plane, I'm off the plane, off of the boat, but they did have a dock built out, and we were, we were out there. And some years later, I went to Hawaii on business, and one of the young ladies that worked for the people I was working with there asked me if I'd ever been to Hawaii. I said, I didn't know. And she said, well, how could that explain that to her? I said, I don't know whether that counted or not. I've never been on land, but I've been on water. But, uh, but that was just a stop on the trip for reasons I never have understood. But then we went uh, down to uh, an island that was in the news just last week, Johnston Island. I don't even notice or not. There was a heart, uh, hurricane and they evacuated the island. And the Johnson Island one time was the last island between the, uh, the Japanese and, uh, I guess, Australia. But it was very, we didn't get off there either. They just unloaded some stuff. And we went to Guadalcanal where we, uh, where we, and this is long fighting was done. Became quite a, uh, another one of these casual centers. Uh, marine aviation, uh, developed a policy very early in the war that you would not stay overseas for years and years and years. That I, I think it was 14 months, but it may have been only 10. I've thought about this since, since I talked to you and I'm not sure. Sometimes I think one, sometimes the other. But in other, word, in, other way, in other words, when you reach that time, let's say it was 10 months, then you would be rotated back to the States. And then people would come out to replace you. And the idea behind this was that there's a morale factor that uh, those South Pacific Islands where you stayed and waited for something to happen so long would, could, could very well get to you. There's no, nothing around, no cities, uh, nothing to do, all the recreation you had to create yourself and so forth. Uh, I don't mean that you lived in, uh, in fear or, or uh, you were fed well and whatever. It wasn't anything, no physical abuse, but a decision was made that uh, at the higher echelons that this would be a good thing to do and that's what they did so I went out as a replacement uh, in that in that uh, in that category uh, small world department I played high school football in Evansville and as I got my gear to throw onto the truck the guy throwing it off was a teammate of mine I hadn't seen him before or since as a matter of fact named Jimmy Wolf and I don't know what happened to him I, when I go home I'll ask about him and nobody figured out what happened to him. But in any event, he was on his way home. Evansville, Illinois? Indiana. Indiana. Yes, way down in the southern part of the state. Uh, but then uh, we flew to Bougainville. And uh, I was assigned to a dive bomber squadron. Uh, the Navy code was, uh, V was heavier than air, then M stood Marine, and then this particular was VMSB, 241. I like the fighter squadron was VMF, whatever. And 241 was a dive bomber squadron that had been at Midway early in the war, but by the time I got with them, all of their personnel from Midway had rotated back and, uh, and so forth. There weren't any of those still around. Uh, we <coughs> 
Bougainville uh, was one of the first military campaigns uh, that kind of established the overall strategy of getting of winning the war in the Pacific, and that is that you, you at first the idea seemed to be well you're going to have to take all these islands that the Japanese had occupied, uh, and I don't know who's responsible for this. You get various various uh, theories from the what little military history I've read. Uh, decide no, we don't need to do that. That there are certain sections of certain islands that we need. Others we'll just bypass and let them die on the vine. And uh, in Bougainville, Bougainville is a relatively large island. There's this huge harbor, very useful deep water harbor, and kind of like a half moon around it that is very useful for airstrips and whatever. And then the rest of it is almost in uh, a mountainous and jungle mountainous. And so uh, the, uh, the Marines and Army that went there and took Bogan, that part of Bougainville, took out that section. And then the Japanese were pushed back up into the mountains and remained there until the war was over. There was, uh, after the war was over, they went back up and found some of them. And there's some interesting stories that I've read since about how they got mail by submarine and so forth. And uh, uh, we played, I remember playing baseball there one afternoon. And uh, from the jungle up there, we heard a guy yell at the umpire. He missed a call at second base. A Japanese guy was, <laughs> was, was watching the ball game. And I can't repeat what he said, but he said it in English. It was uh, uh, something you might hear at an American ballpark. But in any event, uh, uh, we were there for just a little while. And we flew uh, missions to the island of Rabaul which is mentioned in um, South Pacific. Mm -hmm. uh, which I have mentioned. And, yeah, and uh, Rabaul was a big naval base that uh, to the very bitter end, I think the Japanese were waiting for us to invade and we never did. Uh, that was one of the many places that was, uh, was simply bypassed. Uh, there a short while, and we, the squadron I was in developed a technique whereby, see the old, that old Douglas dive bomber, there was on the um, instrument panel, there was a sign that said, do not dive in excess of 110 knots. I mean, it, by today's standard, it would stop in, in air. I, uh, that's not literally true, but you, you could just barely go. But, and you did not have a bomb sight. You pointed this, your nose at what you wanted to hit. But it had an ability to come in low and then release the bomb and then take right off. Uh, but you could bomb within, really, you could bomb safely within a quarter of a mile of your own people if, if that was called upon. So the technique was developed that, that our outfit would send a pilot with the infantry outfit. And they would be in radio contact, and we, we would run usually units of three. Uh, airplanes, the, these dive bombers, that would, would fly around overhead and the ground people would see a, a target uh, down to a machine gun nest, a single machine gun, and it'd be over so-and-so, and the with people on the ground talking to our people in the air, they were able to zero in, and then they would, they would go in and bomb and strafe whatever was called for, and then peel off. Uh, some of it was almost like a football play, you'd say, uh, in, in code, uh, on three. Well, that meant you went in and strafed twice, and then on the third time you went down, you went down like you're going to strafe, but you didn't. And then when you started that third march, then our people would, would rush in and take advantage of the surprise. Uh, one of the interesting aspects is that uh, very early on in that, uh, we developed, it developed, we didn't need our people. We did need communication. And we had a, a group of Navajo Indians that came with us. And, of course, that's been a real interesting World War story, and you see some TV presentation of those old guys like me now. And that's all very, very true. Those, those men uh, uh, just did a, a superior job, and all they did was talk in their own language. And that uh, you could hear the Japanese, it drove the Japs crazy, because the uh, Japanese had a lot of people who could speak English. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'd like to find out sometime how many UCLA graduates there were in the Japanese Army, because every time you'd hear, uh, when you, in a lot of it, you'd get yelling back and forth, they were that close. 
and uh, UCLA would come up, Peru CLA, I don't mean to be racist here, but they have trouble with U's. Uh, and uh, th that got to be kind of a standard joke. But then <coughs> those, uh, that facilitated that greatly because then you didn't have to worry about codes and whatever. And of course, that was the biggest danger if you uh, missed signals, why well, you yeah. could kill a lot of wrong people. Did you meet any of those Navajo? Oh, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Servicemen? Yeah, uh, totally segregated by their own devices. They, uh, mm -hmm. I met a lot of them, uh, but I never sat down and had a conversation with any of them. Mm -hmm. They, uh, they kept to themselves, uh, uh, not uh, belligerently so. I mean, it was just uh, just accepted. Uh, I don't know if we had pushed ourselves on them, whether it would have made any difference or not. I rather think not. I know this is probably hard for people to understand, but uh, I don't think there was any bigotry involved in this. It's just that's the way way they appeared to want it. Uh, they were in uniform? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They, they had gone through boot camp and the whole bit. They were, they were bona fide United States Marines in every aspect, and they, but they'd been recruited. As I understand it now, this, this happened different from my, I wasn't there when this was done, but they went through boot camp as platoons. Uh, platoon uh, consists of roughly 60 men going through boot camp. And uh, there were some, as I understand it, some Navajos and some Apaches. Uh, and then I, another group, I'm not sure I remember the tribe name that I heard of that came from that Four Corners area uh, somewhere. That, uh, but there were quite a number of these people in a uh, number of items, a uh, number of outfits, and they were, as I understand it, quite instrumental in the success of several landings because they could go ashore and then be in contact with the supply ships and uh, uh, I, I, watching the uh, D-Day stuff, I wondered what would have happened where they had all that miscommunication there if, yeah. if uh, they'd had those people there. Probably wouldn't have made any difference, I don't know, but the thought ran through my mind. But in any event, uh, uh, so we, having developed that, we went to uh, uh, Luzon, and uh, we employed that technique uh, with the 1st Cavalry, and uh, landed in uh, Lingayen Gulf about, I think it was D plus 5, uh, uneventful landing. Uh, no, we were not, we did not go in under fire. June 11, uh, 1944. Or, or deep, this is D-Day uh, of Luzon. Of Luzon. Right. Thank you. Well, oh, yeah. Uh, it, it would be Luzon. in 45, yeah. Yeah. See, they, they, the, uh, they invaded Leyte. I probably should look this up, but I didn't. But they invaded Leyte much earlier, a couple months earlier, which is one of the Philippine the islands. that campaign out in the car. But well, in any event, in any event, yeah. And uh, But we went in about... Oh, I'm going to guess eight, ten mile, and set up a camp on a uh, rice paddy that had been leveled somewhat for uh, to, to allow airplanes to land there, and it uh, it had the little uh, dikes like built around it, uh, but it was a huge area, and we went in there with uh, I guess two other squadrons at least one other, and I think probably two other squadron. And then we flew these missions pretty much on an everyday basis uh, while the 1st Cavalry went, went to Manila. And uh, we had limited casualties. We were bombed nightly, but lightly. Uh, that was uh, interesting. They told us to dig uh, foxholes to get in to protect herself against the bombing, and we all did. We dug a little hole uh, the first day, and then the first night we came over and actually dropped some bombs, and the next day, boy, those holes were <laughs> four or five. People cut down coconut logs and so forth to, uh, uh, to build them. It's a big difference between uh, when you think it's going to happen and once it's happened. Uh, we lost, I guess, two or three airplanes uh, I don't think any by enemy fire. I think we did have a couple that went in and got down too low. Uh, but we did not have overwhelming casualties, but we did, we did have some. Uh, then after Manila fell, I, I did get to go to Manila. Uh, had a very interesting thing happen during this particular time. We had a young guy with us who was 
I nearly always was the youngest one around. I ceased being this time we got to the Philippines. Uh, young, young kid was from Boston. We had a lot of guys from Boston. And his brother, older brother, was a Catholic priest and was a missionary uh, to the Philippines. And they had not heard from his brother uh, since the fall of Bataan. But they did get a couple of messages which uh, uh, indicated that he might be alive. So uh, here again, once, uh, uh, once Manila fell, we had nothing to do. And uh, we uh, commandeered an army jeep. Let, I guess that's a fair way to put it. Uh, I wouldn't say we stole it, but we lucked up on one, put it that way. And this guy and two other guys, uh, I was one of them, uh, took off in the Jeep up toward Baguio, which is in the northern part of the Philippines, and uh, look, started looking for his brother. And we got some information that indicated, yeah, probably he was up there. We did not find him that day, but the next day another crew took off, and darn if they didn't find him, and he, uh, he came back with his brother and stayed with us then for uh, the rest of our tour there in uh, in this little town in uh, in, in uh, northern Philippines, well Luzon, and when I got my, I got one day uh, to go to Manila, and uh, we still had that same jeep, and he went with us, and I was so glad that we had that because he knew, and uh, we saw, uh, you know, a great deal. And of course, the thing about the Philippines that I will never understand is the way the way the Japanese just leveled what they call that wall city once they knew they'd lost the city uh, there were these beautiful I'm told architectural masterpieces in the old section of uh, Luzon uh, in Manila that just senselessly uh, were were leveled and uh, so we drove around those places and we went out to the he took us out to the Manila ballpark I'm a baseball nut and uh, they're, sti they're on the fence. They had painted the name of the person who'd hit the home run there. And American All-Star team had traveled out there uh, before the war, and even, at, even as late as 45 now, they were still on the wall. Babe Ruth, and Lou Gehrig, and Jimmy Fox, uh, with the, as they've done in Atlanta with where Aaron hit the classic home run, where they had painted on the wall the name and the date uh, of these, uh, uh, the times that these uh, balls had been hit out of there, the place was was shot up a little bit, but not 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 too badly. Not you know wasn't leveled by any means. But anyway, that was interesting, and it was just interesting visiting with the people. Uh, uh, we were very very graciously received, particularly up there where we were up there in uh, Mangaldon was the name of this little town, and uh, it was real interesting. The first night or two, we set up camp there. Why the uh, uh, the men came down and they visited with us. Well, then the, after a day or two, they figured we were going to behave ourselves while the older men and children accompanied the men. And then finally, the uh, uh, women uh, came down. And then, uh, then lastly, the young women came down. But uh, I don't think we had any, I know in our outfit, we didn't have any problem. Anybody got out of hand at all. They were the most honest, appreciative people I've ever known. And. Uh, uh, one one episode that's uh, stuck in my mind all these years is that the uh, uh, young girls, and some of them were very beautiful, very pretty girls, uh, would do laundry for uh, for pay, uh, very reasonable. And I was broke; I'd lost my money playing cards. And uh, uh, the the group the group came in to gather up the laundry, and one of them, she was kind of a large girl, could not speak English. The, uh, there were four of them. Three of them could. She could not. And uh, I saw her talking to her sister or friend or whoever she was and kind of nodded toward me. And the uh, uh, young lady said, where's your laundry? I said, I don't have any laundry. And she, they spoke again. I could not understand, of course. And she said, well, surely you have laundry. You know, you haven't had any. And I said, well, I'm broke. I have no money. So they talked again and the girl said, Give us your laundry. We pity you. <laughs> I thought the expression was way, so I I gave my laundry. Uh, incidentally, uh, Doctor Gomez here in town. 
mm -hmm. is from Dagupan. In the Philippines? In the Philippines. He's from, and Dagupan was the town of some size that was close to us at, uh, at Mangaldon. Uh, you might I'll wanna, look him up. Might is wanna, he an older gentleman? He's younger than I am. But, but he, he, he I'm sure, I'm, well, I'm sure. Uh, perhaps not, but if not, uh, yeah, yeah, else. yeah, he, uh, uh, but uh, at, we, we stayed there uh, till the rains came, and then as the last, at the very last minute, uh, the rains came a little early from our weather reports, and we had to, uh, we were, on, we were, we were, the, the outfit had already been shipped out. But there were about, oh, 30 of us that were left behind to kind of wrap up things, and we were going to fly to our next spot uh, rather than to take the ship. And we were the ones that got caught by the rain, and we had to get up middle of one night and get everything packed up and get out of there within uh, just a short period of time. We flew down to Clark down by Manila. Or incidentally, I had the best meal I ever had in my life. They had a uh, all-night mess hall there. It was run by the CBs, and uh, they w we they fed us a full supper about one in the morning, and it was absolutely delicious from based on what we'd had. Not that I was deprived really, but it was not very well prepared. Couldn't be under the circumstances. But uh, down there, they had all the facilities, and uh, so we spent the night there. And then the next day. Uh, we flew down to uh, Mindanao, and uh, Mindanao was uh, the whole campaign there was was like I was talking earlier about Bougainville. It was just very little land that was taken, but uh, by the by the American forces. But the Philippine resistance was extremely in effective at Mindanao. The Moro soldiers. Uh, were not all that well organized, but they just did not give up their territory. So there was practically nothing for us to do at Mindanao. I don't, I don't ever remember us flying a combat mission out there, although we may have. But uh, it was there. I was at on Mindanao when uh, the atomic bomb was dropped. And uh, I remember that very distinctly. We had one guy in our outfit who had a radio. His name was McDonald. He was from Radford, Virginia. We called him Sack Time because he was all time in bed. Uh, and he came walking out of the heat of the day, and we knew something big had happened, or get him out of bed. And uh, he said that they'd had a new bomb called the Atom. And he said they dropped one. He said, said it secured a whole city. He said the whole city is gone. So that gathered us around the air, uh, around the radio and uh, his radio, and then the loudspeaker. Uh, they hooked the radio up to it for our, from our uh, headquarters tent. So we were there. Uh, I was there during that time when, uh, then when the war ended. So when the war ended, I was there at Mindanao, and uh, a guy who. Uh, at the time, I was a very close friend with his name. Tom Brown was from Commerce, Georgia, mm -hmm. and uh, he and I laughed about it. The only thing that we could do to celebrate the end of the war was ring the gas alarm. There was we were way out in the jungle, uh, all by ourselves. Uh, there was another, I guess, two other dive bomber squadrons there with us, and which meant a total of about less than eight, nine hundred men, and uh, no, no town, no nothing, just. Uh, we were put out in the middle of the desert somewhere, and so that's uh, that's where we were when the war ended. Uh, when the war ended, they came out with a, a means of systematically discharging people, and you were given points, and you're given points for months in service, months overseas. Uh, you're given five points for uh, major engagements. And somehow or another, I don't know how they counted, but I ended up with five of those, I believe. Uh, so, and the, the number of points that you needed to get out was, let's say, 85. I think that's right. 
me, and I had 79. I was six short. So the first bunch went home, and most of the guys that I had been with uh, left. Uh, then we got a bunch of replacements in, and uh, they were to uh, replace those of us who were to go home. So there was about 25 or 30 of us, and uh, one of the guys that was in that group of 25 or 30 was a friend of one of the guys who replaced him. So, and they stayed in communication, so that's how I kept up with things. <coughs> so the, the outfit was assigned uh, uh, to... I was sent to Las Negras Island in the Admiralty. Manus Island, Las Negras were right there together. There's a bridge, the Seabees built a bridge between them. And the equator almost ran through them. It was, that's where that was located. So I went back south again, is my point, to be processed to go home. So they flew us down there to uh, Las Negras. And we walked into this uh, headquarters shack, and there was a captain there. Uh, I never forget him. His name was Morgan. He was an old he had retired as a master sergeant in 1940. Then when the war started, he came back in, and he was a captain. He was an adjutant. And he was an old salt of the oldest order. And uh, as we walked in, he looked down to the stage, said, what in the hell are you doing here? You know, and I was in front of the group. I was a buck sergeant by then, and I guess I was senior man of that crew. And I said, well, we didn't come by choice, Captain. I mean, you know, <laughs> we got off that airplane out there. He said, well, been sent home. I said, well, you know, you're not going to get any negative votes on that. So he said, well, he put us in a, uh, uh, a hut. They had a, uh, they were square buildings. I don't remember the name for them, but they were maybe 18 feet square, mm -hmm. had uh, windows that you pulled up on the side and then like transom. Quonset hut. No, Quonset hut was long, had a narrow top. This was a little bit different. But anyway, that's not a major issue. But any, in any event, we had a couple of those we went into. And he said, don't unpack. He said, keep your sea bags packed. He said, you'll be out of here in a day or two. He said, this is all a mistake. And, and in fairness to him, he, he, he worked at it. I mean, he, he was not one of these guys who tell you something and then forget about it. He, he realized that this a mistake had been made and that we were paying for it and that he was going to do what he could to get us home. But about, he kept coming down every day and saying, well, I, he said, I can't get anything done. I can't get anything done. But he, he did, they didn't assign us any duties at all. We were in a, or we were officially assigned to a, uh, a squadron that flew uh, R4Ds, which is a C-47. It was a transport type deal. I think the whole outfit didn't have but one airplane, but in any event, it was a, uh, set up for that purpose. And uh, he didn't assign us any duties, just, you know, just uh, stay, stand by. Well, after about three weeks, he came in one night, it was, after, it was dark, and he sat on a bunk. I never felt so sorry for anybody in my life, I guess, it was him. He said, man, he said, I'm sorry. He said, I've done everything I can do. But he said, this outfit has been assigned to Sing Tao, China. And we got to leave day after tomorrow. And he said, you are in this outfit. So he said, I have no choice. We have no choice but to have you go with us. So uh, we got aboard a ship. And we went from, uh, from Las Negras to uh, Singtao, China. And got there early in November of... Uh, now, where are we? 45, I guess. Yeah. Uh, and what was done at that time is that the, uh, the American forces trying to benefit Chiang Kai-shek occupied uh, major communities in uh, major uh, areas in North China, uh, at least cities. There were some, some in Tencent. There were some in uh, Tsingtao. I don't know where else. Uh, and we did not go out and make any effort to uh, combat the communist troops that we knew were out there. But we just were sent there, and the idea was to uh, 
uh, bring the Japanese prisoners back home, and there were a, a large number of Japanese up there that had to be sent back. We personally, we never had anything to do with it, but it, but they were there. We were we were put in a, a air base there that had been used to train Japanese pilots, and the facilities were were pretty nice. And they brought in Chinese uh, people to clean up and whatever, and. Uh, while I would not want to do it again, it was really an interesting experience to see just the difference in the economy where you have all of these um, people where labor is just dirt cheap. But there was uh, one case I remember in particular. It was a boxcar sitting outside of our window. And it was about 75 to 100 yards from an engine. And rather than have the engine go get the boxcar, they had people push the boxcar to the engine. Uh, and they didn't really push it. They just got enough of them on it, leaning on it, that it finally got started and went down there. But it was just a, they just had just a multitude of uh, uh, what we used to call coolies, uh, you know, to do that kind of labor. So uh, we uh, that, that was, a, uh, I wish I knew enough about the, politics and uh, ec economics and so forth to really learn from that. But see, the only currency that you had there was United States currency, which we brought, and the Japanese war currency, which of course obviously was going to be worth absolutely nothing. And one night in particular, I remember there were six of us went into Sing Town. We ate at a restaurant called the Sun Restaurant. And they had a huge round tray that they brought the food out on. And they brought the food out on one tray, and it took five trays full of money to pay for it. The, the uh, Japanese currency was like, you know, 65,000 to one or whatever. So you had these huge stacks of, of uh, Japanese money. And they didn't have Chinese currency in circulation? No, in no, not yet. I'm sure. Uh, Sing Tao, and, and I've, I've never taken the time to study this either, but Sing Tao was an unusual, even... Uh, Chinese city. It was a very European city. It prior to uh, World War One, it was the base for the German Pacific Fleet. Then one of the prizes that Japan got out of World War One was Sing Tao, and Sing Tao had been the a, an important part of the uh, Japanese Navy uh, even prior to World War Two, and. Uh, uh, I remember when one of the few trips we took to town, uh, I was impressed by the number of uh, Caucasian nuns that were uh, in the city there. I assume they were German, but uh, there was quite a, uh, a number of them uh, walking around uh, freely uh, without any apparent fear of any kind, uh, and, and look, obviously they had done that from uh, I say obviously, uh, you'd think that they'd been there all through the war. I mean, they were not, uh, didn't look like they'd been, well, I know they hadn't been imported uh, uh, lately. But in any event, I can't, we quit taking uh, Adabrin when we got to uh, Sing Tao. Now, Adabrin uh, was supposed to be one of the best kept secrets of the war. It was a tiny yellow pill that you were required to take once a day. And it did keep you from getting malaria, but it kept you from having the symptoms. Really? And uh, uh, it, the reason it was such a well-kept secret was it caused very severe, among a lot of people, very severe uh, skin problems. Not nice to talk about, but if it was history, I guess we've got to tell the truth. Uh, uh, nearly every outfit had two or three people who'd have these uh, sores on their face, which we called the crud. And in fact, we had one guy on our outfit, that was his nickname, was Crud Smith. And it, we just attributed that to the jungle or whatever, but the, after the war was over, they made it known that that was Adabrin. But that stuff was so strong is that we had a basketball team when we were at the, on the Mindanao, and we took regular white t-shirts and threw them in a pot and threw in four or five uh, uh, Adabrin tablets and boiled them, and they were just as gold as the goldest basketball shirts you've ever seen in your life but uh, but I we, we quit taking that and I came down with malaria so that uh, I did not I spent of the time we spent in uh, North China 
I didn't do much because I had malaria, and I had it, I guess, pretty badly. Uh, I guess there's a light case of it. I don't mean I was at death's door or anything, but I was too sick to, to do anything. And I uh, had one other interesting thing that happened there is that my wife's uh, older brother, I went to high school with my wife. We never dated or anything until the war was over, but I'd known her all, per, pretty much all my life and her brother. And he was in the Marine Corps. He was in the 6th Division. And on Christmas Eve in 1945, he came walking in our barracks. He knew I was there. I did not know he was there. So we still talk about that from time to time. Uh, he still lives in Evansville and went up there. What are their names? His name is Charles Harris. My wife was Jane Harris. But uh, he came in, and uh, we spent, uh, spent that time together. Then on the 10th of January, uh, that was a three-ring circus, too. They brought in a uh, baby flat top, a baby aircraft carrier. Mm -hmm. And with a number of those, in order to get the people back, of course, there was a shortage of, uh, of ships to get people back from the Pacific, and very few of them could fly because you didn't, uh, at that time, you didn't uh, get on a plane in Tokyo and land in California. You know, they had little short hops uh, and only seat. 30 to, I don't guess we had any kind of a military transport that would seat in more than 50 people. Uh, so it would have been very expensive to, and time consuming to fly people back. <coughs> so that what they did is they, on the hangar deck, they built steel uh, posts and then bolted bunks to them. And you slept five or six deep, but on a hangar deck, with, and then you put the sides down so it was very airy, very comfortable. It wasn't bad at all. So we, uh, this this ship came into the harbor at same time. We were to get on it, and with one of the not infrequent military follow-ups, we didn't get down there until uh, from out where we were down to the to the uh, dock or quay or whatever they called it there until late in the afternoon. Well, that's sing so far north that by 4:30 in January it gets dark. And after dark, they had these small boats, you, you couldn't go out. So we just had to uh, make out for ourselves overnight. Uh, and if you can imagine uh, uh, 1,500 or so Marines and sailors, uh, no place to go, nothing to do, know you're going home the next day, or oh, that night was bedlam. And I still don't understand how everybody made it, but they finally did. But by about 9 o'clock in the morning, while well, we were ashore, and we came back from uh, from Singtao to uh, San Diego, and uh, they uh, we passed one rock, a little bitty island, uninhabited island. Didn't look like it was oh 75 yards across. And they, somebody was was part of the Japanese islands, whether it was or not, I don't know. But that's the only thing we saw <coughs> until we got to San Diego. We came into San Diego; it was foggy and uh, we were sitting dead still in the water. And we all thought that we were out waiting for the fog to lift to go to, uh, into the harbor. When the fog lifted, we were sitting right in the middle of San Diego Harbor, right off Point Loma. And you can't imagine the cheer that we had. So uh, we then went back to Miramar <laughs> again uh, from there, and they processed and put, uh, divided you up by where you enlisted. And if you enlisted in Louisville, uh, you were discharged at Great Lakes Naval Training Station, which is north of Chicago. Uh, close to Evanston, Illinois, is probably what you thought I said when you asked Illinois or Indiana. But in any event, it's up north shore of Chicago. Uh, we, we stayed around Illinois for just a few days. And uh, they were very well organized at that time. And they got us out of there put us on a train, we went to, from San Diego up to L.A., put us on a, and we had a Pullman again. We'd have sleep two below and one above. Mm -hmm. But uh, the three I was with, one of them was a guy named Danny Bolter from Chicago, and Danny was about 6'4", so, and the other guy was named Tommy Moore, and Tommy was shorter than I am even, so we agreed to let Danny have the upper bunk by himself. So we, uh, we came back and went out to Great Lakes, and once you got there, they had a, they had that thing really organized. You had seven days. 
and you had something to do every day. I don't mean you, you stayed busy all day, but they had different processing things to go through with your medical and get your insurance straightened out. And uh, I don't remember all the details, but uh, then, and they worked seven days a week. And we got started on that process on a Sunday, and I was discharged on a Sunday, about four o'clock. And uh, the, the next train left for Evansville at seven o'clock, I believe, and it was four o'clock. And I thought, well, I'm not going to fool with this. I got on the highway and I hitchhiked, and the train passed me at Sullivan, Indiana. <laughs> I, I ran to try to catch it, but I couldn't catch up with it. <coughs> but I finally got home, and, and that was uh, the, the, the end of that. So uh, I came down with malaria two or three times that summer. I got, I got home. Pardon? After returning. Yes. I, I got, let me get, let's see. I was discharged in February the 17th, I think. Of 1946? Six, yeah. Uh, see, we left, left Sing Tao in January. That was a 21 or 22 day trip. Uh, the time I had the week at Miramar and the week getting started and so forth, it was the 17th of February. And I had made up my mind I was going to go to college. Uh, I finished uh, just seven days for a while. I did finish, but I graduated in three and a half years, but I did have, uh, you know, I didn't get any special dispensations. A lot of guys did. If you needed a credit or two, why they'd look the other way or whatever. But in any event, I did just barely have enough. And uh, as I say, after I uh, I came down with malaria in March, uh, and I remember that because uh, in Indiana, high school basketball is a big deal, and I was at a local. It was actually called a Marine Hospital, but it was set there for the river uh, people. The Coast Guard ran it, Evansville, right on the Ohio. And the um, people who worked those barges and so forth were covered by the, uh, I don't guess it was the Coast Guard either, National Public Health Service uh, ran that hospital. And when I came down, uh, my family doctor said, well, you know, if, if I went out there, they would treat me without cost. And I was there in the latter part of March. Then I came down a couple more times, but then it finally burned itself out. So uh, technically, I am a disabled American World War II veteran, but with a zero disability. So, and all that proves is that if I come down again, I won't have to prove that it came from the came from the service. But that had its benefits. The uh, uh, GI Bill uh, was was quite liberal, but if you run this, I think it was called Public Law 13, if you were disabled in any fashion, uh, you had, um, well, additional benefits. In fact, had I known about it and had I figured out what I was going to do at that time, I could have, could have stayed in school and gotten a PhD under uh, Public Law 13 if I designated that my vocational choice was to be a college professor. Uh, I became a college professor later on, but I did not think I would be at that time. But I did have enough time on the GI Bill to get a master's degree. I went straight through and got a master's degree in master accounting. Mm -hmm. uh, I came to Athens to teach at the university, and I lasted four years. And I'm still not sure whether I quit or got fired, but in any event, the dean and I agreed one of us would have to leave, and we flipped a coin, and he won, as the old story goes. But uh, uh, completely truthfully, my oldest boy, I have three sons, my oldest boy had uh, majored in accounting and had worked briefly for, uh, at that time we call them the Big Eight, one of the Big Eight firms in Dallas. He'd gone to school at Baylor. I went to Baylor as well. Uh, <clears throat> and he got caught up in the Vietnam thing and ended up at uh, Fort Benning. And he came up here to visit and liked the area, and then he found out that he could get out of school, uh, the Army early if he went back to school. So he enrolled here at Georgia as a master's candidate. 
and he and I decided that we'd go and practice together. So we formed a, an accounting firm, which uh, still is in existence uh, here in Athens. And the name of your firm? James W. Kelly and Associates. Uh, I think it's the oldest firm in Athens now operating under the same name, believe it or not, but that's, I, I it. <laughs> there are other, okay. there are other people who were in practice before we were here, and, but they've changed the name or whatever, or rearranged the organization. Of course, I have two. I've retired. I retired four years ago, I guess, first of June. And Where I'm, are your offices? Are they out just... behind the mall, if you know those buildings right behind Sears, mm -hmm. and uh, there's a three uh, facing a little courtyard like out there, and our office is on the left. We got the first upstairs and downstairs. Was that Actually, your original location? No, we moved all over town. Um, as a matter of fact, I never. Uh, worked in that office because uh, the day we moved out there was the day I quit, literally true. But uh, we started out in Whitehall. Uh, as you go out Millage and make the turn there before you get into the uh, university property, across the railroad track, there's a little low-slung red brick building. And it belonged to a... Uh, a guy got me in the, gave me the idea of starting practice here. While I was at the university, there was a fellow ran a construction firm. And somehow or another, he got my name, and he had to have some work done in a hurry. And uh, he couldn't find anybody in town that would do it. And two or three of the local practitioners suggested that I might, and I did. And we ended up moving into his office when he moved to Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Then uh, we outgrew that, and we rented the house that's right next to Prince Avenue Baptist Church, directly across the street from the President's house. There's a old Victorian type house that's in there. And we were there for five years, and uh, more or less, I guess it was five years. Uh, and that's when the church was, if you, don't, you remember or not, there was a lot of local hassle about buying up and whatever, and uh, uh, the fellow who owned the property uh, couldn't make up his mind what he was going to do. And one thing, he's a good friend of mine to this day, but there was a business disagreement, so we just decided we'd better move out. And we moved into uh, some, place, uh, some space out on uh, Oglethorpe. Uh, there's a run perpendicular to Oglethorpe behind, uh, well, Bishop Park is on both sides of it, as a matter of fact. And we stayed there. Uh, and and I, as I say, uh, that lease ran out, and uh, my uh, my son uh, found this space out there, and we got both sides of not both sides, but the upstairs and downstairs there cut a spiral staircase wow. on the inside, which was uh, not yeah. nearly as expensive as you would think, as a matter of fact. But uh, so they've been there now for. I guess five years. Is uh, he your only child? No. No, I have uh, uh, two other sons. Uh, Bill, my middle boy, uh, lives over in uh, Bethune, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. He lived here in Athens for quite a while. Uh, has a, got a master's degree from the university uh, in history. Uh, then he uh, worked around Athens doing two or three things, thought he might want to be in the Domino's pizza business and started in that for a while and, and uh, ended up managing a store. Uh, decided he didn't want to do that and uh, he and his wife moved to uh, to Columbia. Bill's been in very poor health and uh, had his colon removed and whatever and is just now getting back to where he can go back to work really and he's been, he's an antique nut like his mama and uh, He's kind of fiddled with that for a long period of time. Does reasonably well with it. In fact, he was here yesterday. I mean, he's, uh, and then my little boy, Steve, uh, Bill went to University of Arizona and then came here and got a master's degree. Steve went to Baylor. Uh, I went to Baylor and Pat and uh, my oldest boy and Steve went there. He majored in voice and drama. And uh, his first job was with uh, Houston Opera Company. Yeah, he's never been a performer. He's always worked backstage. But while he was at Houston, that's back when they had money in Houston, and uh, one of their patrons uh, gave him a, uh, 
a sizable grant which enabled somebody, I don't know who it was, to write a modern opera based on Robert Penn Warren's All the King's Men. It's called Willie Stark is the name of the piece. And uh, the first time it was ever done was done at the University of Houston by a, a student opera group. And Steve went out from the Houston Opera Company to direct it. Uh, when they, they being Houston Grand Opera Company, now put it on at their facility, they decided it was more musical comedy than, uh, or musical theater, not comedy really, but musical theater than opera. So they brought Hal Prince from New York down to direct it. Uh -huh. And he took a liking to Steve, and then to, when, when he left there, he took Steve back to New York with him. And Steve worked for him for two or three uh, plays while Prince was in a slump. Uh, well, he had, to have. well, it was. Uh, but uh, he, uh, one time, Steve was a part of Broadway trivia. He uh, worked on the most expensive flop in Broadway history. Oh, they've, they've, since, they've since lost that, uh, oh, but yeah. uh, it, was it was called... Uh, the Dolls World, I guess. All right. It was based on when no more than what happened later on. Now, if you can imagine making a musical out of that, and they couldn't, is what happened. But uh, and then <clears throat> they did a couple other things. One was a straight play, uh, and he said he just couldn't handle that emotionally. They'd work all that hard for all that time, and I think the Dolls World ran three nights or something. And just uh, so he went in the advertising business, and. Uh, uh, had a very interesting experience. He worked on a Jello account with uh, B, and then then he was assigned to uh, Alka Seltzer. And because of that, they sent him to Germany for a year. Uh, Alka Seltzer is owned by Bear Aspirin, which is a German company. And uh, they anticipating the marketing problems that they'll have with uh, the common market. Uh, really interesting to me. We visited him over one Christmas uh, while he was there. You cannot walk up and buy aspirin across the counter in Germany. You have to ask a pharmacist for it. And uh, you can get it, but you have to ask for it. And uh, very few uh, patent medicines like we have now, and, and the Bayer people are so powerful politically that they've kept out the Tylenols and whatever. And uh, in order for them to work, this common market. But anyway, Steve spent a year on that and came uh, and worked briefly for Channel 13, the PBS station in New York. But about two months ago, he went to work at RCA Music Hall. He's, uh, Tyle, I think, is associate producer, and he's producing the Christmas and Easter shows for uh, Radio, City. Radio City Music Hall. So uh, he's had a very interesting life. That's uh, quite a career. Yeah, uh, to be as young as he is. But in any event, uh, he's, he's, uh, of course, Steve was our only really one at, that uh, much of anybody in Athens would know. He went to Clark Central, and mm -hmm. uh, while he was there, they put on the Music Man as a high school production, and they sold the place out three nights and whatever, and it was, right at that time, it was a very hot issue, and he was, he played Harold Hill in it, so, uh, a lot of people uh, for a short time knew him in any event. How old is he now? Let's see. He is... He was 22 and 79. Well, I go back to when he graduated from college, so that's that makes him... years ago. So yeah, 37. 37. Yeah, yeah. Um, let me ask you about moving to Athens. Yeah. Um, how did it come about, and what year was that? Okay. We, I, I jumped around, did quite a few things. I decided after a number of years that I wanted to teach school. So I was in San Antonio at the time practicing accountancy for a, a local firm. Uh, went back to the University of Alabama to work on a doctor's degree, which I never finished, but I, I did go. Spent a year there and went to uh, what's now University of Southern Mississippi at Hattiesburg. Then it was called Mississippi Southern College. Stayed there for eight years. That's where my two oldest boys graduated from school, from high school. High school. Uh, very early on in my accounting career, uh, 
Well, the man I work for in San Antonio was instrumental in starting a continuing education division. And uh, I worked, uh, did some leg work for him. I don't mean to imply that any of this was my idea, but I did some leg work for him, which put me in contact with the people that got this thing started. And very early on, uh, they asked me if I would serve as what they call the discussion leader for some of these groups, and I did, and I rather enjoyed it, and I'm still doing that, as a matter of fact. But they were wanting to, to, un, uh, to put together a, a major package of training materials uh, at the American Institute. And when Bill, my second boy, graduated from high school, we decided if we were ever going to make a change, this was the time to make it. So I, we moved from Hattiesburg to uh, New York. And I worked for the American Institute for a little over two years. And when I went there, a friend of mine that uh, I had uh, uh, made his acquaintance when I came to Alabama was named Skip Jurgen. And about the same time I went to New York, he came here as chairman of the, the accounting department here. He replaced Mr. Heckman, I guess. And he told me, when you get ready to move, well, let me know. So uh, after we we kind of between a rock and a hard place. We enjoyed being in New York. I enjoyed what I was doing. But Steve was then getting ready to start junior high school. And we weren't too sure we wanted him to go to junior, to junior high school and high school in suburban New York. I think looking back on it, that was foolish, frankly. Uh, but that any, in any event, in honesty, that's what we thought. So I did shop around a little bit and uh, ended up coming here. Uh, to teach. And as I say, uh, after four years, uh, I decided, well, I was not cut out for the academic environment of teaching school. But uh, the other aspects of it, I find a little bit hard to deal with. But And, and then, then too, Pat, when he, when he got out of school, he worked for a big eight firm, as I said earlier, in Dallas. And he did not want to go back to Dallas, and he didn't particularly want to go back with that firm. That, I, I don't mean that, that they mistreated him in any way. They did, and it was just one of the things that he didn't want to do. So when he suggested that maybe we could go together, why, uh, well, you know, well, why not? So we started from absolute scratch. We didn't have a single client, which was... And what year very, was that? Uh, Let's see. Wait a minute. Past six. That must have been 71. So you 71. probably moved to Athens about 1967? Uh, yeah. 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 We, we moved out to Cedar Creek. And uh, as I said earlier, my wife and, and uh, well, my two youngest boys in particular, the oldest boy a little bit, but the two younger boys in particular are really antique nuts. And uh, we, f we worked with a realtor, and she found us a house on Deering Street, uh, 190 Deering Street, that was up for sale. And it had been turned into five apartments back in the 1920s. And we bought that house and restored it. And uh, that was quite an experience and uh, are you still living there no no we sold it after Steve left school uh, there's a huge Victorian house there it's cross street where Jim Barrow lives right mm -hmm. one block up from where the tree owns itself but on the other side of the street and uh, we sold it to a, a professor at the university and his wife and her mother uh, and they had three or four and uh, they really needed the room, and I, I didn't want to lose it, or leave, leave it, because I really enjoyed it. But uh, when one of the little girls came by and said, "Oh, this will be my room," I figured, "Well, okay, <laughs> it'll be well taken care of," and it has been. They've done a real good job with it. Uh, we left there, and uh, the house at Hancock and Millage, and at that time it was uh, uh, condemned. And my wife said, you know, that, that I would love to have that house. And I thought, good gracious, you know, there's nothing there that I could see. But we bought it and, uh, and, uh, and put it back together. And uh, 
we won a award from the realtors for the uh, for that. Uh, that was the outstanding restoration job in Athens that year, or whatever. Uh, but then uh, again, it was more house than we needed, and we we uh, sold it to a doctor here, who and then in turn sold it to a outfit that went in business there. And now the university's bought it, and they got a sign up there, something Finnessy something house, which yeah. which yeah. intrigues me. I, I wonder where they got those names, you know, because it was old Jim Kelly that, uh -huh. <laughs> and family that uh, restored the thing. That uh, maybe this is not the time or place to say it, but I'm a little fed up with these old Athenians telling me how much they love this town. When, uh, uh, as I've seen the restoration work done around here, it's done by folks from elsewhere. But that's a, that's another issue. But we live out in uh, Glenwood now, and. Uh, probably will finish out our days there at least in Athens. Let me ask you to turn back with me and I'd like to hear a little bit about growing up. Um, is it Evansville, Indiana? Yeah. What did your parents do and do you remember some of the those depression years where you were young? I, yeah, I vaguely remember the depression. My dad was born uh, in Kentucky. He was from a very big family. Uh, they uh, were dirt farmers in western Kentucky. Uh, little, it's in Webster County, Kentucky, which is uh, just south of Evansville, um, Morganfield, Sturgis, over in that area. Uh, I have some pictures of uh, Dad's family uh, back in those days. Grandpa uh, eventually went to work for the L N Railroad. And at that time, the northern terminal of the L N Railroad was actually at that time it was called Howell, Indiana, but Howell has been annexed into Evansville way back, I guess, before World War I. But the family moved from uh, uh, western Kentucky to uh, Evansville uh, when my dad was just a, just a small boy. And he went to work, the whole family went to work for the railroad. Uh, Grandpa, uh, I never did figure out what he did, but anyway, he uh, he piddled around the railroad. And Dad started out as a call boy, that which meant that he'd stay over at the railroad uh, headquarters. And then, if they needed a train, or somebody didn't show up, or they had a special train or whatever, he would before they had telephones, of course, and he would run over to the appropriate crew members and wake them up and get them to come to work there and he started doing that when he was just like eight ten years old he ended up being a mechanic but he got cut and he but he went into World War one my dad was uh, in World War one and in fact he he was in there at the same time he had three other brothers and I have a my sister found this in the local paper there was a front page story about my grandma and her four boys that were in the service has their pictures and all <coughs> which is one of my prized possessions but in, my dad was about nine years older than my mother, and uh, she was a choir director of this Howe uh, General Baptist Church, and that's when they met and then later married. Uh, dad was laid off during the Depression. See, I was born in 26, and I don't, I remember, I don't remember the first place we lived. The second place we lived, we all moved back together and in a very small house, there was my dad, my mother, me, I have a little sister, and my first recollections are her being there, my mother's mother, my mother's grandfather, and an aunt of my mother. We all lived in this little little house. And uh, dad uh, just did what he could do. He didn't have a regular job for a little over two years. But I can, that's a, my first recollections are of my dad being gone when I woke up in the morning out looking for a job and coming back at night most time not having done anything and that's was very telling on him. Mother directed a choir uh, which brought in a little money and then my grandma uh, she was a night cook at a hospital which was only a block away from where we were and uh, they had a for the night shift where she she cooked them a meal that they ate around midnight and uh, so then my aunt had some kind of an office job and I don't know. 
but she didn't stay there very long. My recollection, she moved to Chicago. But my great my great grandfather, who lived with us, was named Jim Smith of all things, and uh, he was uh, both deaf and blind, and uh, he could hear if you yelled at him, and uh, but uh, then my dad got a job with a uh, security deal they call merchant police. Mm -hmm. And he walked a, a beat and shook doors and made sure that they were locked, had certain people would pay a fee. And he worked uh, 12 hours a night, uh, seven days a week for a number of years. One of the stops on his beat was a funeral home. Uh, a man who was had a, uh, the, the bulk of the funeral business in Evansville, and he was, was very well wired, wired politically, so he got all the coroner work and that type of thing. It's, too bad, I guess. That's the way we work, but we always have. But he stayed very busy. He's a real, very fine man, Mr. Schaefer was. He did a lot of good for a lot of people. But uh, he had somebody to quit in his organization, and since Dad would come in there to his place of business at, during his tours at night and get warm, uh, they knew him. And uh, so Dad went to work then for Schaefer's, and he went to work again uh, 12 hours a night, seven days a week, uh, working around there. And, uh, and in addition to that, of course, back in those days, you had a lot of machines. Two people had an automobile. I mean, we didn't have a car until I came back from the service, for example, and uh, that was typical. I mean, I don't want to sound like an abused child. I wasn't. But uh, uh, they, the family and all would hire a limousine. And uh, then if there was a two drivers needed. I think Dad was second on the list and he drove for that. So he did that up until uh, he was working for Schaefer's when I uh, went into service. Now while I was gone, uh, Chrysler had brought a, well the, at that time it was Briggs Body Company and Chrysler Assembly were, had a plant there in Evansville. And during the war Chrysler got a contract. They made a lot of the uh, ammunition for carbines which was that 30 millimeter, I mean 30 caliber uh, weapon, uh, semi-automatic. The M1 was the standard big rifle, but this carbine came out and had, the ammunition was, was quite a bit smaller. But <clears throat> a good bit of that, I don't know that anything, what percentage, but a good bit of that was made at what was called the Evansville Ordnance Works, which was a, a subsidiary of Chrysler. Dad went to work as a guard out there, and he, he stayed out there through the war. Then when the war was over, uh, he went back to work for another uh, funeral home, and only this time he did get to work daytime. He didn't have the all night. They worked all night because they were on ambulance call. At that time, the, the, uh, the ambulance service was provided by the funeral home, and since Mr. Schaefer was wired politically, they got the ambulance work there. But, uh, and he did that until he retired. He worked up until his 70s. Did your mom continue to direct church choir? No, well, she did up until I don't know how long. She, uh, my mother and dad both taught me something about when you get too old, quit. And uh, she gave them up. And they asked her why. Her last one, they said she said she was too old. They said, oh, you're not too old. But then they replaced her with a 30-year-old man. So she said, see, <laughs> she felt like she'd made her point, and should have. I mean, you know, you you get worn out. Uh, and you, you run out of ideas. I don't, I don't mean that to make a, a derogatory sense at all. I mean, it was just indicating that I think she was right. Did you have any brothers or sisters? I had a younger sister. She's two years younger than I am. She married uh, a guy that I'd gone to high school with who uh, went into service seven days, I think, after I did. And uh, he went in the Air Force, and he was a B-17 gunner. And... Uh, flew in the first raid over Berlin uh, as a as a gunner. In the early days of the war in Europe they had a, a recycling program like the Marine Corps did, only theirs were based on, mich on missions. And MIT actually was back in the States by early in, in uh, 44. Uh, he went through training uh, rather quickly. Uh, was assigned to England, uh, flew his, I guess was 50 missions, and uh, came home. And uh, when he came home, I, uh, he never 
paid any attention to my sister when we, he and I were in school together. She was a freshman when we were seniors. But the uh, time I got home, they were married. And uh, so uh, he was one of them. That, in fact, he drove the car to come out to get me the night at the highway when I called the house by the morning from an all-night diner that, uh, that I was back. They didn't know I was coming home that quickly. Uh, he died just a few years ago, but we remain close friends. Of course, that's one of the things about World War II that uh, bothers you, uh, particularly when you hear things like Hiroshima and I don't know how we're supposed to be ashamed of all of that, that uh, really makes somebody like me mad. Because uh, one of the things we did when I was on Luzon, I didn't mention earlier, and I guess I should have, we were part of the crew that went down to rescue the uh, prisoners at the uh, uh, Japanese prison just out of Manila called Cantabalan, I believe it is. I'm sure I'm pronouncing it inappropriately. I never did get it right, but it's C-A-T-A-B-A-L-I-N. But there were a great number of uh, the people from uh, Bataan that were incarcerated there during the war. And uh, I think it needs to be said over and over again, despicable as the Germans were, they treated our prisoners better than the Japanese did. And uh, I get a little fed up when I hear about, uh, you know, the mistreatment that uh, we imposed upon other people. Uh, I remain one of them who's absolutely convinced I'd not be sitting in this chair had the atomic bomb not been dropped. And uh, that co that's caused problems with some of my friends here in Athens who have visited in Japan and came home the first time they were ashamed of being American. I always ask them, are you ashamed to talk to me? Because uh, I take that very personally. Uh, in, in point of fact. Uh, that, but what I started to say was, it's the, the thing I guess that's most telling on me, and particularly now, is uh, I think back the number of people I knew and were very close to in high school, in particular. You see, coming out in 43 in high school, class of 42 and class of 43 in high school, uh, and well, maybe 41 would have been would have been just as bad, maybe worse. But those three high school classes caught the biggest brunt of the of the loss, and uh, the number of people that I played with and played ball with and played against and so forth in uh, in high school that uh, either didn't make it or uh, came back in bad shape. Uh, some of them, though, one guy I think in particular came back without a left leg, but he seems to have, I don't know how much it bothers him, but he doesn't let on like it does. But I lost uh, my best childhood friend. Uh, and then there's, uh, for whatever reason, my high school class has remained very close. Maybe this is the reason. We have reunions every five years, and uh, we had our 50th, of course last fall and uh, that draws in a lot of people who otherwise haven't been been coming but it you know brings that to mind that we've got a long list of I don't know, 10 or 15 I went to a fairly good sized high school and uh, I guess there were 10 or 15 of them who uh, didn't come uh, what was that best friend's name Bill Ossenberg uh, he has three brothers, uh, uh, two of them were too young to get in the war. Both of them went in the Army, but it was after they went in in 46. His older brother was in the Navy. But uh, there was a set of twins, uh, Bill and Bob Shear, and Billy Shear got killed at Saipan. That, uh, I think about him because uh, he and his twin brother and a guy named Buck Nunn enlist two weeks before I did and the twin one of the twins was sent back and he went for some kind of medical problem and he straightened out and went back the next week and then the following week I went so we were three weeks apart and then I saw Billy two or three times when I was at uh, Mojave he had an older sister who joined the Marines and she ended up at Mojave I did not know her a at woman that, uh -huh. joined the Marines in those days? Oh yeah, yeah. Starting '43, they had the women Marines. Yes, 
was that did they have a, a nickname like Wax and Waves? Or uh, well, they had one that was colloquial, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> well, we called them Bams. Uh -huh. That was for broad ass Marines. <laughs> if, you, if you want to censor that, that's okay. But uh, no, I don't think so. I, I I think officially they were just they were called women Marines, and uh, they had a pretty large detachment relatively speaking at Mojave. They took over uh, the tire operation, for example. Mm -hmm. Traffic control? Yeah. Uh, actually run the towers. And uh, we had uh, uh, two or three of them in the weather uh, were forecasters. Uh, I don't know what all else they did, uh, quite frankly. but. Uh, they they came out there to. I guess it was forty four. And I said forty three. That's wrong. I'm I'm pretty sure they didn't start until forty four. But if it was forty three, it was very late. But they had. Uh, there were, quite a number of them, uh, you know, scattered around at, at various bases. I don't think any of them ever went overseas. And I don't think they ever let any any of them go even as far as Hawaii. But. Uh, we had an attachment, but Bill's and Bobby's older sister, and then she ended up marrying a guy who was in my outfit there at Mojave. Uh, so I've kind of kept up with him through through the twin, uh, through uh, Bobby, who's still uh, alive. Uh, oh, we had a, one girl there. So, uh, stuff that stays in your mind. She was a great big girl, very attractive. And I don't mean she was big and fat, but she was just big. She was about 6'2". And she was from Maine. And uh, we were sitting around one night drinking beer in the PX, and uh, she was there. And uh, we got to talking, you know, about this, that, and something else. And she had gone to the University of Oklahoma. And somebody asked her, said, well, why in the world would a girl from Maine go to the University of Oklahoma? And she said, well, look at me. She said, I looked it up in a book and said the tallest men in the college men in the country were in Oklahoma. So that's where, <laughs> that's where I went to school. I often wonder what happened to her. She was really a bright, I don't even remember her name, but she was really a bright, she was one of the tower operators and she had a reputation of being very, very bright. She was a, did, did a good job. But there were, uh, I don't know of anybody locally I've ever run into who was a woman Marine. Uh, interesting to have heard about I mean I, I hadn't heard of that unit before uh-huh and that was a platoon or a, a no 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 they were they 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 were they were recruited they went to boot camp the whole bit mm -hmm. and then they got sent out uh, as indiv as individuals no it wasn't a one-shot deal mm -hmm. oh no 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 I tell you something else they did a lot of uh, trying to figure out what all they did was in supply mm-hmm uh, a lot of uh, at Mojave there, we had, uh, in fact, looking back, we had a brother-sister there at, uh, in the uh, supply department at uh, Mojave. I don't remember their name anymore, but uh, we, uh, I can't remember, I don't know, the details of that are vague in my mind, but I remember that brother-sister thing, and then we, uh, they didn't work around the kitchen. And of course, see, all the Marine medical people were Navy anyway. So we had uh, the nurses that we had were, were Navy nurses. Do you think they ever imagined there would be women in combat someday? Oh, no. Yeah. No. No. It's I, I don't. interesting to have heard. I didn't, I didn't know there were women Marines. Yeah, well, that'd be interesting for you to chase down there. I'm sure there's, there's bound to be somebody, somebody here who. Uh, uh, but I, 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 I don't, don't know of anybody. Uh, you know, Phyllis Barrow was in the Army. I do you know. Yeah, I need to talk to her. Um, if I tossed out a name of a commander or some, some, I'm interested in hearing what you thought at the time of uh, people like, say, the naval commanders, uh, Nimitz or Halsey. Did, did you? Halsey was a particular favorite of Marines. Really? Uh, he is, uh, I don't, I, how much of this is true, I have no idea. <laughs> Let me 
preface what I'm about to say with that. That's, that is a fact. But Halsey was credited with uh, standing up to MacArthur uh, during the uh, Guadalcanal deal. That uh, Halsey uh, demanded, uh, whether that's true or not, I, I say I don't know, but he, according to the folklore, demanded that MacArthur get some help up there when uh, during a period of time when the Marines were uh, being kicked around uh, like they were. Uh, Nemitz was uh, uh, never mentioned. Uh, he was, uh, when, when you, when you were, were in there like I was, uh, you know, we didn't see, we didn't see a chicken colonel, you know, let alone a general. Uh, and the only reason that, that we rubbed elbows with officers at all was because the pilots were almost without exception officers. And the commander of a squadron was a major. And, and there may be one major, there would be one major, maybe two. Uh, but the rest of them were captains and first lieutenants and second lieutenants. And all the ground officers would be a captain at, at the top. So the, the idea of uh, any kind of association with, uh, or really any feeling for or understanding of, uh, except for somebody like, like Halsey. Now Halsey, when I was at Bougainville, he'd do this kind of thing. Uh, he entered the horseshoe pitching contest mm -hmm. and got to the finals. And he, I saw him several times. Uh, he, he walked around quite often with a uh, Marine dungarees outfit on, and he had your name stenciled on the back so people wouldn't steal it. And he had one bull. I mean, that was, uh, was his nickname. And they tell the story uh, for the truth uh, around Bougainville that uh, uh, we spent a lot of time swimming at Bougainville. It was a, a, a ideal beach. It is, and it's where it is. It was really nice. And we'd go in the, in the and and uh, I did a few times, and I don't like to do that kind of thing, but people who like it spend a lot of time there. And that, uh, that here was this guy, and he had a tattoo on his arm. I forget what it was. And he was swimming down there, playing around in the water with this young kid who was a coxswain on a little landing boat. And the kid talking to him thought that uh, uh, Halsey was a chief, a Navy chief. And he didn't say anything that would make it any different. And they got to talking about chow. That's one of the things that always came up. What did you have to eat? You know, chow was food, of course. And uh, the chief said, well, you know, it's pretty good. He said, you know, I can't complain. He said, boy, it ain't like it's on our ship. He said, boy, we got a, we got a cook. He said, the best cook in the Navy. And he went on and on and on. Said, and he said, on Thursday, he fixed cherry popovers. And he said, man, he said, you, you come some Thursday. And the following Thursday, he showed up. <laughs> and, of course, the ensign running that thing was about to have a tizzy, of course, with the admiral of the fleet coming up. And he said, well, you know, Admiral, are you coming to inspect? He said, no, I just came to eat, you know. <laughs> so uh, whether it happened or not, why, it, uh, if it didn't, it should have, because that was the kind of reputation he had. Now, there was a bitter hatred of MacArthur by Marine Corps personnel. Now, whether that's justified or not, I don't know. Can you talk about that for a little for me? Well, uh, there was a feeling that uh, MacArthur was uh, overly protective of his reputation, and uh, that he uh, had the idea that, you know, we're going to have to uh, overpower, uh, take every island, island by island, and, uh, and only when we had time to, to build up. Uh, and, of course, there's a lot of uh, feeling about his leaving, uh, his leaving the Philippines. Uh, and it's... You know, it always intrigued us. So here's this picture showing him wading ashore at uh, at Luzon, uh, but the cameraman got him from the front. You know, <laughs> he wasn't exactly the first one there. Uh, I never saw him. He um, he flew into the base that we were where we were flew out of uh, Luzon at one time. I understand, but uh, it he came in early evening and I wasn't around and. I don't know whether that's true or not. You really didn't even, you know, you never saw any of these people. Uh, when I was in China, we, uh, 
we, we lived in these, these barracks that had sliding doors. And you had, I guess, was six cots in each little room. And then there was a hall down the middle. And here we had nothing to do also. It was getting cold. It was cold in China. We had a little oil heater out in the middle of the room. And one, one day, unannounced, that door slammed open and a brigadier general said, on your feet. And of course, we got on our feet, and he had uh, General Geiger was with him, who was a three-star. And he looked and said, "This place been fumigated. I never <laughs> didn't know how to take that." <laughs> but uh, that's that'd be about the only uh, only officers, and particularly high-ranking people, that you had any any comment about. But, what about uh, FDR? Did you think? What did you think of him at the time? You didn't. Uh, um, I, I, I was in uh, on Luzon when he when he died. And we got that announcement. Uh, there was some concern about uh, Truman, who was. Uh, it's interesting how much more uh, popular he's become. The longer he's uh, longer he's uh, lived, the the press. Uh, Clinton thinks he's got problems. Uh, he certainly has no more problems than Truman had. I mean, he was a political hack from Pendergast machine, and uh, uh, I don't know how many times I heard he'd never even been to college. Uh, uh, he was uh, uh, considered to be uh, really a non-entity. Uh, but you got to keep in mind too. See, when that happened, I was what, 19 years old? Oh yeah. And uh, uh, the the political ramifications uh, of uh, of any description didn't uh, was was never a matter of conversation. Uh, I pro and I probably was more interested in politics than the than the average guy. Uh, at that, because my dad was very insistent that I learn about uh, civics, as we call it in those days. I can remember as a child being taken down to the courthouse when they counted the vote at night and so forth, and because uh, he was very interested and I understand how everything operated. As he didn't have it a third or fourth grade education, he never could remember which, but that bothered him. That, uh, and he wanted to make sure that didn't happen. So I probably was more interested than the average person, and I didn't care if that uh, uh, that makes a point. Uh, How about the food that you got at those different posts? Can you tell me a little bit about your rations or your chow? Uh, um, well, uh, at, that was one of the big differences in the Marine Corps between Paris Island and uh, San Diego. Uh, the Paris Island people complained bitterly about how poorly they were fed. We were fed well at San Diego. Uh, you gripe about it, you know, but uh, and then I think partly too is the fact that, that uh, most of the people that I was with, the enlisted people, uh, had come from backgrounds similar to mine and that uh, I, I never went to bed hungry in my life. But I didn't know what a steak or a chop was. You know, my I uh, ate well, uh, never felt hungry, but I would never have gone into a restaurant or dreamed of going into a restaurant and ordering a T-bone steak. I wouldn't have known really what that meant, and that's almost literally true. So we had uh, we had uh, uh, more than more than uh, edible uh, food. Now when we got to. Uh, Norman, at that big base there, uh, that that food was not too good. It wasn't wasn't bad, but it was not too good. But in, at the uh, time I got to Mojave, uh, we had good cooks at Mojave, and we had one guy in particular. And you get to rambling like this, a lot of things come to mind. His name was Manning. He was from Mishawaka, Indiana. And he was waiting for the water to get over so he could go back to Mishawaka and order a, open up a restaurant. And, and he really worked at it. And he, uh, we had some real good meals there. And I don't ever remember having anything that was, you know, really bad. Now overseas, uh, they did the best they could with what 
with what they had. And we went several long periods with uh, K rations. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and there's a surprisingly wide variance in the uh, uh, excellence, if that's the right word, of K rations. If they were stale, they could be terrible. But if you got fresh K rations, having had stale cash rate, uh, K rations, that was quite good. Can you describe uh, K rations for me? Yeah, K rations came in and it looked like a Cracker Jack box, a little bigger. It, it were labeled breakfast, dinner, supper. There would be a a can, looked like a cat food can, about that size. Of uh, like for breakfast, it'd be eggs and bacon. Well, you'd have to have a good eye to find the bacon, but there would be. Uh, and if you could take the time to heat them up, they were pretty good. Uh, then there would be a, a, a cracker. There would be uh, instant coffee. Uh, for lunch, this was always funny. You got a, all of them had this entree, I guess you'd say, in the can. It would be uh, cheese. And then they gave you a prune bar, which <laughs> was totally appropriate. Uh, and then it had lemonade powder. And then for uh, the supper might be uh, roast beef uh, or roast pork. Uh, and it would have, uh, and they would have again, like lemonade powder, some kind of a, a hard cracker. Uh, for, for bread, I may be missing something. There may, may have been more than that in there. He always had cigarettes, two cigarettes in there. Then we had, uh, I think they were called five and one or ten and one. And you got a box, and it's to feed five men. And there'd be a big can, like a, a juice can at the supermarket now, about that size. And they had four or five different uh, meals in there. They had chicken and dumplings. They had uh, ham and sweet potatoes, roast beef and something else. And all of this, really, if you, if you had the time and the facility to take it out and heat it up so you could eat it warm, it, was, it wasn't bad. I mean, you know, you could, you could get along. But most of the time you had to eat it cold, and that was a big problem. And then one stretch we had where we had Vienna sausages 31 straight days, breakfast, dinner, and supper. And I cannot eat a Vienna sausage to this day. My, my brother-in-law, bless her heart, uh, uh, I hear people talking about their mother-in-law. I have to take a different chit because she was a real lady, single mom before we knew what to call them. But she was a fine person. And when I first got home and I came over to visit, uh, my now wife, and she invited me for supper one night. And just as a joke, she put a can. She didn't open it. Just a can of Vienna sausages in my plate, and I could not eat. No. <laughs> but uh, she felt so bad about it. But she was just trying to be funny, and it, it was funny. But that, that really got to me. But uh, then occasionally, uh, you'd come to the mess hall, and you'd see the sergeant of the guard there with a list. And when you come up, you check your name off. Well, you knew you were going to have something pretty good there. So uh, if, like, you had fresh eggs, uh, okay. But you could only come once, see. And I remember one time, we well, right after we had those Vienna sausages, we had them for 31 straight days. We came to mess hall, and we had, I believe we had, uh, we did. We had bacon and eggs and toast. And, uh, uh, man, this is great. And then we came for dinner. We had fried chicken. And then for supper, we had uh, uh, steaks, little cheap steaks. We thought, man, the war is over. The next day, we were back on Vienna sausages. But the, we heard later on that the colonel said, if you get it in here, feed it to them. So, because if it sits around here a day or two, it'll disappear. Uh -huh. So, uh, so you, you, you had that. You could always tell if you had something really good by uh, if, the, if they checked off your name. Interesting, too, about the malaria is at lunch, we had a Navy corpsman. He sat on a high stool right as you came by. You, the last thing you got was your cup of uh, coffee in that tin cup that was a canteen cup. 
and he'd sit on his stool and you had to open up your mouth and he'd literally throw that adamant tablet down your gullet because they made sure that you took it. That was the way they made sure of that. And I got to where to this day I can swallow medicine. I've, I've got arthritis in my wrist. I fractured my wrist some time ago and I take a lot of pills and it just astounds my wife. I'll put a couple aspirin or Tylenol on my mouth and take about well, I have, have finished my glass of water except for that, that that's on the ice, and I can swallow them to this day. So she said, well, that's got to be right there. I said, no, it, it's not. So you learn some skills that may not be overly valuable, but let's stay with you a long time, you know. Did you have to take that quinine for that malaria? Yeah. Then, <coughs> I, that did to start. And that gives a ringing in your ears and so forth. But then the last time, each time I had it, and I had it, I guess, I must have come down four times after I left the service. But each time I had it, uh, it was a little bit less in intensity. And then I was told that during the war, the, some prisoners at the Joliet Prison in Illinois had volunteered to be guinea pigs to, uh, for adamin treatment, and that they developed a drug up there that supposedly would, I don't know whether it's cured it or eliminate the symptoms, I don't know the difference, but in any event, the last time I went in, I was in Baylor at uh, Waco, and uh, they gave me that medicine, and then I never had it anymore, so I don't, but as I say, it was, you could tell the intensity was less and less each time. Uh, you get very high fever with uh, malaria and you have the chills and every other day you feel good and every other day you wish you could die. It's uh, one of the sickest six, I guess, that you can have. It doesn't last forever if they, you know, if they get on it. And uh, I was never down more than a week or two. But uh, I did, after I came down with it, I went from 170 to 140. When I came, came home, I weighed 140 pounds. Obviously, I've improved on that since. <laughs> I'd love to see 170 uh, again. Myself. Yeah. Um, do you remember some of the popular culture of the time, some of the uh, radio or music or movies? Well, uh, that was the heart of the big band era, mm -hmm. of course. And I, I am, a, to this day, a big band uh, music fan. And uh, that was the biggest thing. We, we would go to Hollywood. Uh, there was a place called the Palladium, which was a big dance hall, and it brought in all kind of people. Uh, I had a very interesting, to me, very interesting experience in connection with that. When I, I mentioned earlier, I had this trouble with my ear. It got infected. And they sent me to the hospital at Balboa Park in San Diego. And, uh, of course, they'd never do it now, but the treatment consisted of 30 seconds of uh, x-ray treatment twice a week. But I was felt fine. Uh, just this scar was unsightly, but they put a bandage on it, and uh, I didn't scare anybody or anything. If they could have seen the ear, it would have been. But, but at this time, there was right down the hill from the uh, hospital was uh, the palladium equivalent in San Diego of the... Uh, called Balboa, again called Balboa. And I was there when Stan Kenton put his second band together. I don't even know if Stan Kenton or not. Well, okay, I was talking last night to my grandson's Little League game and nobody knew who he was, But uh, so that's the reason I said that. But uh, as I say, I felt good. And they would come to rehearse every afternoon at 4 o'clock. And I would go down there, I'd be by myself, and I'd take a folding chair and sit it out in the middle of the uh, dance floor while they rehearsed. Well, of course, they all noticed me, and I'm sure they didn't remember my name or anything. But in any event, uh, I heard that together, and to this day, I'm still a Stan Kenton fan. Was then, as a matter of fact. He left me a little bit later on. He got too wild, but during that time. Uh, movies, uh, we, we had movies every night in the States. Uh, I don't remember any of them in particular. When they had the war movies and you saw all these heroic acts being performed that were totally unreasonable, of course that 
got a great cheer from the audience, you know. I remember John Garfield one time picked up a 50 caliber machine gun and held it in his arms and shot it, which he had about as much chance of doing that as I got jumping up the Alps Road from here. Uh, that, that kind of thing. And then in Mojave in particular, uh, we were extremely fortunate. Mojave sounded exotic, like it was way out in the desert and that you really made a sacrifice to get there. In point of fact, it was a two and a half hour bus ride from Hollywood and Vine. So Bob Hope and, and uh, uh, Ben Crosby never came, but uh, Bob Hope's crew came out there and we had several of these bands. Alvino Ray came one time, I remember. Henry Bussey came one time. And they had, at that time, of course, they had radio shows, hour-long radio shows that they would put on at various military installations. So we got more than our share of those at, at Mojave. And overseas, we had, uh, that was one of the first things they would build, would be a place for to show the movies. And you had to bring your own seat. Uh, we were laughing about that one night, and when we were in Luzon, one of the guys was from Queens in, in New York. And, so he's going to have to break himself. He, he and his wife said, well, let's go to the movies, honey. He said he'd get up and reach for his chair and take it with him, you know. But we had 500-pound uh, uh, bombs came packed in a case that had, well, it stood about, once you dismantled about this high, it had four pretty sturdy metal legs on it and then a flat top. And nearly all of us commandeered one of them for our movie seat. We'd, we'd go to the movie and carry it down there to... Uh, sit and watch the movies, and uh, I I really don't remember any. And then the USO had some some traveling shows. Uh, they didn't come by all that often, of uh, of military people. Uh, that uh, um, some of them were really quite good. And they were all, you know, pretty good. Of course, the other side of it too, they had a captive audience. It was either that or or. Uh, play cards and uh, there was not never enough reading material I mean you yeah. see the thing the thing about it that I guess it's hard for people to understand but we'd go weeks at a time without doing anything just you know routine get your work done we'd go over every day and synchronize the uh, bomb dropping mechanism on that dive bomber, which took all of 30 seconds if you'd done it yesterday, you know, and then on, there's, uh, there's nothing to do. Uh, and then particularly after the war was over. Now we had a, at Mindanao, we had an old major, I can't think of his name, but he, he got us all playing baseball. We had a pretty active baseball league that, uh, that I played in. And then he went off and, and brought in uh, some other teams in the area to, uh, so we got to play against uh, Phil Rizzuto and Ted Williams came one time, uh, which was you know a big deal. Uh, when you got to, was that in um, uh, uh, the states or no? That was in Min that was overseas. That was after the war was over. Yeah. Uh, right after the war was over, yeah. and. Uh, uh, he he did this on his own. I don't. He was he was an old timer that could get away with that kind of stuff. But he he'd send our airplanes and get them and bring them over and they'd play ball and we'd feed them and maybe spend the night and then fly them back uh, to you know wherever they were. They had to be nearby, of course. I don't mean they and they were overseas as well. I mean, uh, see, well, Williams was a marine pilot and. Uh, Rizzuto was in the Navy. He was an enlisted man, but uh, uh, and then there were we had a basketball uh, court. Uh, Moose Krause, who was athletic director at Notre Dame for a number of years, was in the outfit right next to ours, <clears throat> and he used to. He was a basketball. I think he coached at basketball in Notre Dame for a while, I think. In any event, he played. Played both football and basketball. But I know he, was, he kept, got a lot of stuff going. We had a basketball league among the squadrons and, and whatever. Because uh, they were really concerned about morale because, uh, you know, you had these 
three or four hundred red-blooded kids with absolutely nothing to do. The war over, you know, he knew there was nothing more to come uh, but to get home and uh, try to keep things from exploding. Uh, and we had on a minimum amount of fights and that type of thing, or some of that, uh, but that would happen, you know, anywhere. But, uh, then when, but then when I got home, everything was regimented toward, you know, just getting out day by day. It was, uh, and that didn't, that didn't drag on. You, they made it very clear to you what you're going to be doing every day. And uh, they had a, at Great Lakes, they had a, a dance every night. That, that was, it was, but you're talking about the culture, the, the radio uh, and the band music, the big band music, I think were the key things that stick in my mind. Don't. Uh, Did you dance? Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Not not overseas, of course, but uh, but in the states. Uh, like I said, Norman, they had a dance uh, every Thursday night, and it was huge. They had this great, big. Uh, auditorium-like thing, and it it would have accommodated, I guess, maybe two or three basketball games, and then they would bring in uh, the male-female mix was uh, about one-to-one. -one. I mean, it was, uh, of course, they were right there on the edge of the Oklahoma campus, for one thing, and of course, there were practically no men going to school at that time, and uh, and then they, they would come from Oklahoma City. Uh, uh, which was only maybe a half hour bus ride and uh it it was funny you'd, i'd go to oklahoma city on the weekend and not not i don't mean this that i was unique at all i mean but you'd walk down the street and uh, in downtown oklahoma city and you'd speak to three or four girls that you had seen or met out at the out at the uh out at the base uh there were that that many of them of course a lot of them were girls who worked downtown at the various stores and what uh, I don't know if this is appropriate or not but it sticks in my mind I was uh, I went back to Oklahoma City uh, with one of these courses for the American Institute of CPAs and we stayed at the I think it was a Seelbach Hotel name might be wrong but it was downtown Oklahoma City and we stayed there every time and when I got there, it was not right. When I came out the front door, you're supposed to look to the left, and there was a restaurant there, a family restaurant, like one, like a last name, Bradley's or Evans or something like that. But when I came out the door, when I went back this time, it not only was not that way, it was that way, and it was up the street. And I, it shouldn't have bothered me, but it did. It frustrated me. And I, after about a day or two, there was an old black gentleman who was a bellhop there. And he was sitting on a little seat right by the elevators waiting to be called. And I sat down beside him, and I told him just what I've told you. I said, how long have you been here? He said, oh, forever. So I told him, I said, now, when we came in here before, that was down there. No, no, he said, I think you're mistaken. So I was, I was in the checkout line. And he came and grabbed me by the arm. He said, hey, you're right. He said, it, this has always been the main entrance. But the entrance that everybody used was on this side, and that's where the liquor store is now. <laughs> so <laughs> you don't know how relieved it made me, you know, that uh, I hadn't lost my mind. But were there other examples of, give me an example of uh, some of the duty that was, was so boring. Um, were there other examples of, of some of the jobs and tasks you were given? Um, either overseas or stateside looking for some of the some of the everyday work uh -huh. details well uh, you know, with what what I did uh, we were we were charged with the requirement of maintaining the uh, uh, armaments and then after I got overseas I did fly some as a gunner in the uh, back seat of an SPD but uh, here again, you'd be uh, in the air for 
three or four hours a week at the most. Uh, and during the rest of the time, uh, other than just, you know, maintaining your area, making sure it was clean and sanitary and so forth, uh, you had all time you were being called upon to uh, police up the area, which was the expression. And we used to have a, like a broomstick with a nail on it, and that was called dive bombing. You'd go out and pick up cigarette butts and uh, wrappers and candy wrappers and whatever was on the ground. Uh, and, and, and I'm sure... A, it made the place look good, but uh, B, most important, it, it, it did uh, did keep you busy. Uh, now, when you were in, like in boot camp, well, that was nonstop. Sun up to sun down, you were either walking or marching. Or uh, We spent three weeks on the rifle range, uh, and uh, you spent the first two weeks just what we called snapping in. You just line up your target and squeeze the trigger and hear it pop and then do it over again. Uh, then finally the last week you you know, live ammunition. But the biggest part of the time, it uh, once I got overseas, we just hurry up and wait. Uh, you'd have a week or two where, like on the, on the road to Manila, while well, we were, we were working from before sun up to after sun down, and uh, a lot of times uh, not going back to the tent area at night, just sleeping. Because, uh, uh, but then that only lasted a relatively short period of time. Uh, the now had had I been at uh, Guadalcanal during the heat of things, or gone ashore at Iwo Jima, or Okinawa, uh, uh, you know, the experience would have been a lot different, uh, no, no doubt about it. Uh, I was extremely lucky in terms of uh, missing a whole lot of the real horror of the thing. There's no, no question about that. Uh, was there anything you were particularly afraid of during those years? Not really. Uh, when, when you were being bombed, it's a terrifying experience. Uh, there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. You, you're just laying there and uh, in a hole. And we were uh, we were bombed, as I say, regularly when we were on Luzon, but not nothing like uh, a whole uh, armada of airplanes come uh, coming at us. Uh, and then in the, when I was working in the South Pacific, and like we flew to Ribal and all, by that time, uh, the, the Americans had uh, pretty much eliminated, well, almost completely eliminated any Japanese air power in the, in the South Pacific. Uh, I'm drawing a distinction now between the Philippines and the South Pacific, the uh, time I got there. So uh, it was just almost like working at the Atlanta airport. You just loaded up the airplane and they flew off and came back. In fact, they used to laugh. They'd, one of the things they always tried to do at Rabal was ring the church bell. There was a dilapidated church there, but the bell tire stuck and they'd try to hit that bell tire with their machine gun fire. Uh, but that was just, they just flew over there on a daily basis just to keep anything from being redone. And you see, if you look at the map of this thing, just the strategy of thing, for example, Ta what we now call Taiwan, which is Formosa, see, that was completely bypassed. And that was, that was a, supposed to be, and I guess it was, a big uh, collection of Japanese forces that were just, you know, made uh, redundant, to use the European phrase, I guess, by just passing it by. Uh, when we, we staged at Bougainville to go to, to uh, Luzon, and uh, one of the rumors, scuttlebutt, was that we were going to Formosa. That, uh, uh, I don't know why I think took that seriously, but, uh, uh, except for a few people. But that was one of, the, you know, one of the possibilities, and I think everybody assumed that there would be an invasion of Formosa, but it, it never took place. And that was one of the one of the key islands. But even if you 
even if you go to New Guinea, which was an army show, uh, you'll see that the, the battles in New Guinea were little bitty, I'm not downplaying them now. I mean, they were vicious where they were, but they did not take the island. <clears throat> they did like, like was done at, at Bougainville. They uh, cut out their little pieces. While I was at Bougainville, incidentally, this was funny. I mentioned the twins, one of them who died. The other one uh, knew I was at Bougainville, and he came and got me. I don't remember what outfit he was with. But he had a weapons carrier that he had commandeered one way or another, and we went riding in that weapons carrier. And uh, it turned dark, and there was an army outfit that was guarding the perimeter. And we went barreling out through the backwoods, riding in that car, driving it too fast, racing it like kids would do, I guess, and being bored. And uh, we heard a M1 bolt slam shut, and the guy says, Halt! Who goes there? You know, it was one of these army <coughs> sentries. So we told him we were friends in a hurry and turned around and went back. You talking about being afraid, I guess maybe that, that was as scared as I got. Yeah, I don't think he was in danger of shooting at us, but in any event, we were... I remember that, and of course I continue to remember that because I see Bobby every five years when I go back to back to reunion. Did you meet Chinese when you were stationed there? Not really. You laid out uh, most of the time. Well, yeah, and and uh, what we did do is uh, the the food that uh, you asked about the food. The food at Sing Tao was not good at all, and. Uh, Our barracks building was right over a footpath that went between villages and on into Sing Tao. It was not a road, but it was oh, as wide as from me to the wall over there, eight, ten feet, and completely worn down with people walking. And we would lean out our window and buy eggs from the Chinese as they came by. And we had this little oil, uh, coal oil heater. I haven't seen one for years, but they bought yay high, and we used to have them to heat rooms uh, before we had central heat. And we got some pans we put on there, and then we would go to the mess hall and get butter uh, and, for, and bread. And one of the guys in our room was on mess duty, so he would be able to steal the butter and bread for us, and we'd eat egg sandwiches. And then they started selling us uh, Paps beer for... Uh, I believe it was two for 15 cents, if I'm not mistaken. Two for a quarter at least. But anyway, we'd go up every night, and, and they'd let you buy all you wanted, but you could only buy them two at a time. And we got a mail bag, and we'd go up there and we'd keep getting in line. And we'd fill up that, well, not necessarily fill up that mail bag, but we So we lived for a good bit there on uh, egg sandwiches and beer. Uh, so to that extent, we did. Now, in the Philippines, uh, we didn't make any really close friends except for the, uh, but the kids that came around. Uh, as I said earlier, I'm a baseball nut, and there were four or five of us. We used we had a baseball diamond we put together out behind our barracks. And when we had nothing to do, we'd go out there and hit. And these little Filipino kids, little bitty six, seven-year-old kids, and then they're small people generally anyway, uh, Filipinos. Uh, would come out there, and they would shag for us, and then we'd always let them play after we got there. And I, a lot of those little kids would uh, latch on to you and come back into the barracks with you and sit around on the floor and talk to you and so forth, which we enjoyed. Incidentally, they, they had absolutely free access to our area, and we never lost one thing. We had one billfold got stolen, and we found out later on that was one of our guys stole it from another guy. They were most honest uh, people that I've ever been around, most appreciative. Uh, and they would come out and watch us play ball. They were, they were baseball fans, and then the little kids would, uh, they, were, they were just cute as a button. Of course, we'd been gone from home, too, so that was a big deal. And uh, I remember carrying little two-year-old kids around. Uh, and they were always looking for sweets, and of course, we didn't have much in the way of that, so I would give him my cube sugar from my K-rations, and then Hershey's put out a synthetic chocolate bar. Synthetic. Yeah, it was square, it didn't melt. 
and it didn't melt when you chewed it either, you know. But uh, but they even liked that. We'd get those and uh, there'd be a package of those in the ten and ones. And, and I guess I guess there was one of those I was saying earlier about K rations. There was some kind of dessert. That was probably it. And then it, and then it had little fruit bars. You know, like like I say, a prune bar went with the cheese, and maybe a uh, like the inside of a fig Newton. You know that that consistency kind of stuff uh, in a uh, in a bar. Uh, Did it keep you regular? Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. Of course, at that age, I don't know that's a problem either. You know, I I, I wonder about that. Uh, you you don't notice, uh, or at least I didn't, uh, things like that. Uh, but the overall health of people was, uh, you know, was never a problem. Incidentally, our dentist in uh, Hawaii was uh, the legendary fullback of the Chicago Bears, uh, Bill Osmansky. Huh. He uh, he later coached the Bears, but uh, the the what's considered to be the forerunner of modern T formation football was the Chicago Bears of forty forty one, and they had this dream backfield, and Bill Osmansky was the fullback, and he was he was our dentist, and that was really funny because he was so he was so scared that he would never be able to make a living as a dentist because people would think he'd be too. Rough. Rough, you know, and he, he's like a mother hen, you know, did that hurt, did that hurt? Of course, in those days, you know, we had the foot pedal to run the drill, and it was it was painful at, at, at very best, but he was, uh, he was a nice guy. Stayed pretty much to himself, but he, uh, we all laughed about his uh, uh, concern. Did he have access to painkiller or Novocaine or any kind of... Well, you didn't do that when they drilled your teeth. No, they. No. But uh, I'm sure they did. For I never had any. I had one filling. I think one in you know, all the time I was with them, and uh, the only reason that I knew that you know the way he acted. But for the most time, he didn't have anything to do. You know, you got. I guess they had a dentist for every squadron. So you take you know 300 young healthy people. They're not. Going Many of them are going to volunteer to go to the dentist. I mean, it, it had to be in pretty bad shape. So he he over there forever. Uh, we had a, a Filipino doctor who came into our place one time, and uh, he had graduated from the University of Chicago med school, and he wanted to meet our doctor and get caught up because he'd been back out in the, with the gorillas for however long that was, three years, I guess. And uh, he stayed with our doctor for, I guess, a week or so. And he read everything that the doctor had uh, to, you know, what was going on. Yeah. If you get put in a situation like that, that's something you wouldn't think of, but just uh, the changes. And, we, and Mindanao, we had a guy with us who was in the Army who had left Bataan. He slipped away from Bataan and stayed at, with, the, uh, with the Moros. As I said earlier, they were pretty well organized, and they kept the Japanese from establishing too much on Mindanao. Uh, and he came in, stayed with us for a while. And while he was with us, he found out that he'd been promoted to major. He was a sergeant, I think, in the Army. And he was entitled to all this back pay, and I was there when they told him that. You never seen such a smile on a guy's face in your life, because he had, I guess, three, four years of a major's pay, which at that time was near a fortune. But uh, that, that would be interesting if you could find somebody who spent the war in that fashion and there were there were several hundred of them that uh, not thousands but there were several hundred uh, American servicemen who uh, stayed in the Philippines I don't mean I don't mean by choice but stayed active in uh, with the with the guerrilla movements and then the Filipinos see way well, went way out of their way protecting America like the people at Contemplation, there's a lot of them that were executed for feeding the prisoners. Uh, now, have you ever seen pictures of those 
they came out of there. Yeah, I've been reading Stanley Carnot's book about the Philippines and long history of the long term, but he he's good on that subject in particular. Um, See, the old the in uh, the old Marine Corps before World War II, that one of the one of the elite outfits was the China Marines. To be a China Marine was uh, the epitome, you know, uh, spit and polish show bunch, but uh, they were in Shanghai. Well, the China Marines were on their way back to the States and in the Philippines when the war started. And they got caught and trapped on Bataan. And you had to be 6'2 and weigh 180, I think, which at that time was a pretty big man. I mean, that's something that's happened in American society that's incredible, how much bigger we got, you know. Uh, uh, and, of course, we were there. There was a bunch of us went down there to get them. Uh, that's when I should have been the scariest in my life, and I don't guess I was, and I don't know why. But we, we literally picked them up and carried them. Uh, they were just skin and bones. They were down to 100 pounds or less. Uh, and, of course, a great number of them survived. Uh, we fed them and then caught unsure at hell from the medical officer because we made them sick, you know. We, uh, that was an interesting day. We went, we went by there, a guy named Jim Sanders from Shreveport, Louisiana and I were in one of the trucks that was, we, we were afraid, we'd been told that the Japanese might slaughter these people when they retreated. So we were supposed to go down head of the lines and rescue these guys and bring them back. Well, what we didn't know was that the Japanese had already retreated. I mean, we were in absolutely no danger at all. We didn't know that. So we went rushing down this road in the middle of the night, no on whatever. Got there, first dawn, brought them back. And we passed the San Miguel Brewery. So we stopped, and they gave us all the beer we wanted. Well, the only thing we had to drink it in was our helmet. And you drink a helmet full of beer, that was 12% our beer, which we were used to 3.2 that they'd scaled it back in those days. So we were in pretty good shape. We got back to, the, uh, back to our place, and we decided, well, that had to be shared with the troops, so we commandeered a water trailer. You still see them from time to time when they have problems like they had in South Georgia with these saw them in Macon, yes, sir. Yeah, they, uh, I don't know how big are they, 400 gallon, not not huge, but not Even small either. Size of a milk truck, I mean. Well, these were smaller than that. These okay. these you, these ran on a, like a tray right. that you put behind a Jeep. They would be, oh, a third of the size of those, but, but pretty good size. So, of course, the people at the brewery were delighted to see the Americans. I mean, they'd been liberated, and they were, uh, they were just delighted, and everything we did was fine with them, you know. So we went back and got a trailer full of beer and drug it back up to our troops. And we had a doctor who got all over us for contaminating the water supply, you know. <laughs> Jim Sanders, we called him Speed. Old Speed told us, I said, Doctor, you had lost your mind, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but we had a, everybody had a pretty good buzz on that night with the, with the beer. I say, I only had two contributions in World War II. I helped literate the San Miguel Brewery and in the Manila and the Sing Tao Brewery in Sing Tao. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that Sing Tao beer is still around, yeah. I think they pronounce it differently. It's sure Sing Tao, Sing Tao. I know they have it at uh, Hunan. Uh, now there's two girls that work for us, at, uh, and by coincidence, my wife and I and the two of them separately had gone to the Chinese restaurant out by Willowwood. And, uh, they were eating it, so I, they were, all four of them were uh, affectionados of beer, so I bought them uh, a bottle each. And, yeah, they, they said they enjoyed it. I don't know whether they did or not. I sound like I'm a real beer drinker, but I'm really not. I drink a little, but not, not, not much, but a uh, good deal of that happened. But it was a, uh, I was thinking last night, walking my dog and thinking about boot camp. And that's one of those things they talk about. You wouldn't take a million dollars for the experience, and you wouldn't take two billion to do it again. You know, it's a, uh, it was a, 
Well, that really changes you in a hurry. I and mean, here you got a 17, 18 year old kid that's. Because I think we were largely disciplined before we came. I, you know, we were scared to death of our teachers, and, uh, and I don't mean that in a bad sense. But uh, I remember when I was in high school, we had a high school math teacher, and he decided that the school needed another advanced course in mathematics. Now, he could know when the world get rid of this right now, but he just simply. He was head of the math department. He arranged for it, and he came and told you you were going to be in it, you know. And I was thinking that last night. I mean, I don't know. It never dawned on me to have told him no, you know. I just, uh, I'm glad I did it. Although, looking back on it too, I had to take a required course in algebra at Baylor, and I had a hundred for an average, and never learned a thing because we'd had it all in high school. But, uh, but I, I think the boot camp. Uh, as a result, of course, you were told when to stand, when to sit, and wherever. But uh, it wasn't probably as bad for me as it would be for like my grandson, uh, because I was used to it anyway. You know, and uh, I'm not saying that's good, bad, or indifferent. That's just uh, that's just the way it was. Well, I'm glad you come back to that, and, um, because I, I think of somehow of a Marine drill sergeant being a little bit more intense than a Army or a Navy drill sergeant, or, or um. that was a perception. I don't know whether that's true or not, but uh, uh, but you, you just uh, uh, they succeeded in a very short period of time of uh, making you understand that you had to do what you were told to do and do it without question. And I'm. I think I'm civil libertarian enough to know that that's not what we want for our overall society. But if you got a war to fight, that's a heap different. And uh, I guess one of the most, if I'm bitter at all about anything, it's the treatment that the Vietnam, Vietnam War veterans got when they came home. Uh, and where that war was right, wrong, or indifferent, I'm not smart enough to know. But I do know this, that uh, they took a lot of abuse from unnecessarily from people who had no idea what they're talking about. And, uh, and it bothers me that, uh, at least from my standard, that there's a people, well, you know, that's, uh, that's how it came about. Because uh, I think if we send, I think that's a big difference. In my, it never dawned on me for a second all the time I was gone that the people back here weren't doing everything they could to support me. And uh, that makes a big difference. Uh, what deprivations you're having uh, become a lot more palatable uh, knowing that, well, you know, this, is, this has got to be done. And, uh, and, when, and, in, and when you did come home, I, I came home twice on furlough. And then, of course, I got a lot of time to go into Oklahoma City and Bakersfield and and uh, Hollywood area, uh, almost without exception, the treatment you got was just some people going out of their way. Uh, I, walk, I went into Hollywood Canteen one time and Roddy McDonald was bussing dishes, you know, uh, and, he, and he was bussing dishes. Now, he was not there for a camera. Uh, in fact, he was back kind of out of sight, but he was getting the dishes ready to go in the dishwasher. Uh, uh, there was that, that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, churches would have uh, meals and uh, at train stations. The town I grew up in had one of the best of those. They had a, a USO hut there. That, and every soldier, sailor, and Marine came through Evansville was got a hot meal and uh, Coke, coffee, whatever, and they manned that thing 24 hours a day. And I remember on one of our trips, I guess going from Oklahoma back to California, I think it was North Platte, Nebraska, they did that. And there were a lot of them around the country that did that. But I mean, they was, these were well-organized uh, church groups, uh, service clubs and whatever would take turns, and they'd always have good to eat and 
so forth. Fort Worth had one, and we stayed in Fort Worth one night, I remember, uh, when traveling, traveling through. Uh, that, that kind of thing you had, and I'm sure they did here, too. I don't know. Never thought anything about Athens until I got here, but I, uh, I don't think there's anything really unique about those places, you know, perhaps unusual, but, uh, and it depended upon the kind of traffic that came through. See, Evansville is across of the, you're going from Chicago to Miami. Oh, that line. That line. Or if you're going from St. Louis to Louisville, that way. Cincinnati, uh, you came through there, so you had both, uh, east, west, and north, south. Uh, Did you ever go through a town called LaPorte, Indiana? Yeah, played football in Indiana. That's where my girlfriend's from. That's right. Okay, you ask her if she's ever heard of the LaPorte Slicers. That's the high school nickname, believe it or not. Yeah, LaPorte, I, yeah. <laughs> we played them up there. And I was bringing back the punts. And they kicked us, and we, it was on a skin surface. And that ball hit and just sat down like a golf shot in the mud. And one of their kids came by, and he reached down and just touched it and kept on running. And I was sprinting over toward that ball, and I was yelling at that field judge. I said, don't you dare blow that ball dead, because you you're supposed to take possession of it. To get it. The touching it doesn't do it. And he looked at me and kind of grinned, and I picked up that ball and ran, I guess, 80 yards with it down the sidelines. They were all going off the field for a touchdown, so I'll, I will never forget LaPorte, Indiana. <laughs> I got a big kick out of that. But he, uh, their coach was having a he was trying to get his people back out there. <laughs> I could have walked because they all left. Yeah, that's way up by in Chicago. Uh -huh. um, you just brought up the Vietnam era. I just yeah. like to quickly ask about uh, being on campus from 1967 to 71 and, and being in this university town during those early 70s. Um, is there anything you can let me know about those tumultuous 1960s in Athens? Uh, I think my own experience is that we had much less activism, if that's the right word, here than they had on a lot of campuses. Uh, we had some. Uh, and I may be totally wrong on this, but I believe that the reason we didn't have a lot of trouble was due to Bill Tate. Uh, our office, as I said, was out there next to Prince Avenue Baptist Church and across the street from the president's home. And I remember very distinctly one time they had a march from down out to the president's home. And I looked out the front door and there Bill Tate was sitting in the middle of the street with love beads on. And Somebody asked him, I read about this later, was he there to observe or protest? And Bill said, maybe I can do both. And I, I believe it made a big difference. I mean, Tate made it clear, or he made every effort to make it clear, that you were going to be able to protest wherever you want to protest, but you were not going to disrupt. And I think that, that, that came to the thing. Uh, I think that had a had an effect. Uh, one on campus, and they were protesting. Somebody decided to break into a building, and uh, you didn't. I didn't. There wasn't a policeman around. Didn't look like well, that kid broke in that building. Man, he was gone in 30 seconds. Uh, and here again, Tate made a speech. Said, you know, there's some things you can do. What there's some things you can't do. You're not going to destroy. So I, I kind of felt like we uh, here in Athens got off awful easy on that. Uh, my 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 problem with with that whole period of time was not so much with the kids as it was with the politicians. If you're going to fight a war, fight it. Don't don't send kids halfway across the world and then not do everything you can to protect them. That's why I feel so strongly about the atomic bomb. 
I mean, okay, if it's uh, this, this may get me in trouble with a lot of people. But during that time, if it was a difference between killing Japanese or Americans, I'm going to kill the Japanese every time. Every time. And that's what it boils down to. And there's, when they, I read something about the Gulf War where they covered up a bunch of people with a bulldozer and whoever the officer was, and I said, you know, there's no nice way to kill people. And there's not. I mean, it's, that's terrible that people have people act like they do whether they have to or not I don't know but once you make that commitment uh, th then you've got to mean it and uh, I don't think it ought to be made lightly uh, I've been very critical of all of our excursions both parties when they're not covered by an act of Congress I think much as Truman is respected and he should be I think he made a mistake by not going to Congress in the, in the Korean thing and saying okay look are we going to go <coughs> or not, and I don't think it ought to be the responsibility of one person, whether they're right, wrong, or indifferent, but I'm no constitutional lawyer, but to me it's pretty clear the Congress declares war, and uh, we've, we've, like a lot in the Constitution, we've waltzed our way around a lot of things, and I, I think that's wrong. I, I, I think it's right now. I mean, if we're going to Haiti, and maybe we should go to Haiti, I don't know. Appears to me perhaps we should, but Congress ought to have to stand up and say, "Yeah." And of course, they they didn't, and uh, I think that's been a, a serious mistake. But and which we didn't have in World War II. I mean, there weren't. <clears throat> I bet there weren't 500 people that were anti-war protesters, <clears throat> and that was partly by the way it started. Of course, you know, uh, I I visited the Arizona. When I was out there in Hawaii, I mentioned I worked out there at that time, and there's two guys still there that I played high school ball against. That uh, were on board. Were on the Arizona. Yeah, they were from Dale, Indiana. Dale. Went down with, and they're still there. See, that's still the tomb for. They never brought those people up. Uh, while I was there, by coincidence, they were doing one of their biannual or annual or bimonthly or whatever checks of that thing. The divers had gone down and they said you can still see people floating down there they preserved uh, that's one reason they're very leery to do much with it because it is the burial spot for a pretty substantial number of people uh, well I think that's a sticks in my crawl because uh, like I say the kids are out there they're, they're not they're like I was. There's no politics involved. You know, you're not worried about who's right and who's wrong. You're worrying about doing what you have to do with some degree of honor and getting home. You know, and not necessarily in that order. If, uh, uh, and to put people in that position and then not to give them 100% support, uh, to my mind, is not just wrong, it's evil. I don't mean to get on a soapbox here, and I guess I have, but uh, well, I feel well, strongly about that. The soapbox okay. You can do what you want with it. I tend to ask this question last in these interviews. It's just, um, out of that experience, what do you think is the most important? What, what do you think, what, what would you underline? What, what, if you're especially if you're speaking to people who only know about World War II from history books or, or even videotapes like this one. Well, I think it demonstrated to me that um, it's amazing what we can do as a nation if there is a high degree of unity. Uh, the fact that we had that many men under arms, well clothed, well fed, probably the best medical treatment any of us had ever had up to that time. Uh, in a short period of time as it took is, is amazing. Uh, I think that there's a, I think the main thing that I got from it was, this is probably sounds contradictory, how important every individual is but yet, in the overall scheme of things, they can get along without you. Does that make sense? 
uh, you've got you got some things to do, and if you don't do them, uh, the ramifications of that can be quite serious in terms of loss of life and what some other issues. But by the same token, that uh, the fact that you're put in that position doesn't mean that there aren't hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people who could have done exactly as well as you did if they'd been put in that opportunity, had been given that opportunity, had been put in that position, if not opportunity is not the right word. Uh, I, I became uh, much more tolerant of uh, people who whose customs and ideas are different than mine. Now, I, I served in a segregated military. Uh, there were no black people uh, in any of the outfits I ever served with. Uh, so I can't say that it, that experience had any difference, made any difference there. But in terms of uh, Protestants, Catholics, Jewish people, uh, Northerners, uh, Southerners, uh, uh, whatever. I think I learned there that uh, uh, you, you, there's a lot of people who think different than I do that are pretty good folks, you know. And uh, <clears throat> and I, I don't know how to explain this, but you you develop a friendship with people and individual people, but there's no particular interest on my part to bring that back. Uh, I know a couple times when we've been traveling, we've been in towns and I said, well, here's where so-and-so lives. And my wife would say, well, why don't you call them? And I just don't. No explanation for that. Uh, I've never run down Tom Brown from Georgia. And he and I were bosom buddies for a long time and a nice guy, a bright guy. Uh, you know, I wouldn't, it's not that I'd be embarrassed uh, in any fashion socially. Uh, he, uh, I've, through, through a mutual friend, I found out that he graduated from Georgia Tech and he was an engineer and uh, worked for an insurance company as a, uh, for a long time in California and has since come back to Atlanta. But I never, you know, took that last uh, that last step, uh, and I'm completely the opposite with kids I went to school with. I mean, it's not just that there's, I don't know, <laughs> uh, but kids I went to school with, I'll uh, kids listen to me, 68 years old, I'm talking about kids, 69 almost. Uh, going back to that high school reunion is a big deal. Uh, but I was talking at the house the other day about a celebration, if any, they'll have when they talk about the recapture of Manila. And I just teased my wife. I said, I think we ought to go. And she kind of laughed, so you can go by yourself. And I said, no, I don't, don't want to. Really, I just was, you know, needling her. Uh, and I really don't uh, have any, any desire go back there at all but it, it uh, I, I think the World War II changed America in that regard I think we're much less clannish than we used to be I mean I to take me for example I've, I've been we have lived in Texas in Maryland in Indiana Alabama Georgia and at different locations in, in at least some of those states, uh, which I would have never have done, I don't think, if I hadn't been for the exposure I got to, to traveling around in uh, during the war. I don't know. I, you know, everybody I grew up with uh, in Evansville, if your parents either came from there or from Kentucky, there was a mass migration from western Kentucky to Indiana during the Depression when the 
farms out there played out. Uh, but but now you're talking 15, 20 miles, you know. You, uh, but as now, uh, well, it's true here in Athens. The second question you ask people, where are you from? You know, uh, uh, it's uh, rare indeed to find someone who's lived here all their life that's, uh, you know, anything like my age. Uh, and that's partly due to the university, but it's that same thing's true in, like in Atlanta. You know, you've got uh, people from all over. So I, I think that had as much effect as anything else on it. It's, it has made me, I'm, I'm much more, I guess worried is the right word, uh, when we engage in such things as we've done without saying whether they're right or wrong. But, uh, you know, Vietnam, Korea, to a lesser extent, Grenada, uh, Panama, uh, you know, this deal right now with Haiti and Cuba. Uh, I'm very, very skittish about the use of, uh, of power because I think I've seen that since World War II that the home folks don't have the commitment to it. I mean, it's, it's one thing to say, I'll fight. It's another thing to say, you ought to fight. And, uh, I guess I'm becoming cynical in that regard. Uh, it bothers me greatly that we have a whole Congress full of people who one way or another avoided service in Vietnam, and that's not unique to the president. Uh, you've got a lot of cohorts on both sides of the aisle there, but now are apparently have no trouble sending people to fight in Haiti, for example. You know, uh, that bothers me. Uh, I guess it always will. Uh, maybe that's unfair. If it is, I'm sorry. But uh, and I'm I don't I don't mean that as a partisan political statement. As Herman Talmadge used to say, there's enough blame on all sides. You can everybody you name in the Democratic cadre that did not go to Vietnam. I'm sure there are one or two that you could put on the other side that uh, uh, which. I guess that changed me forever. I'm uh, uh, much more cynical. Uh, and maybe that was more Vietnam than it was World War II. But I listen to radio shows and hear people talk about these kids coming back in Vietnam crying. That, that, that got to me. I don't know if anybody got treated worse than they did. Uh, I'd like to say, when I came home, I don't mean that there were any bands playing, you know, but you were hail the conquering hero. I mean, uh, uh, where it really mattered to you, you know, you ran on the you ran on the street, people that you've known, oh, run across the street, yeah, I'm glad you're home, you know, glad you're safe, and uh, uh, that that uh, uh, very important experience, and if, had that not happened. I'm sure my whole attitude would have been a lot different because uh, you are left out there to hang to dry uh, from time to time and you, it's very easy to get the feeling well nobody cares about you. Uh, but I think at that time they did and that made, makes a big difference. It still should be that way. I don't know if anything what we could do about it. Is that rambles long enough? <laughs> a lot to say. I'm very grateful for your time, sir. Well, you're welcome. I hope it helps. I, uh, I just by accident was listening to Meg Grant, uh, Gunn's show. I, uh, uh, that one, I don't ordinarily do that. Uh, I guess I ought to. I, uh, one of the first accounting jobs we did in this town was when uh, Meg's father died. We helped, really? we helped her mother kind of get things straightened out. And, uh, it was uh, very interesting. When this light goes on, I'll tell you something about that. <laughs> yeah.
something. None of them remember any of my people. I guess when Grandpa left, uh, that ended. But, uh, so we spell our name K-E-L-L-E-Y, mm -hmm. which is a little bit unusual. And uh, there's a lawyer in Madisonville, which is the county seat town there, uh, William K-E-L-L-E-Y. And I would bet dimes to donuts that he's in the lineage of the William Kelly, who would be my great-grandfather's brother. But I wrote him a note one time. I passed by his office, and he had, and I'd been driving all day, I, and I'm bad once in a while. I don't shave for two or three days at a time. And there's a difference between having a beard and not shaving, I've noticed. And I, I suppose I did not look, <clears throat> well, I know I didn't look as good as I should have. I didn't think I'd scare anybody, but uh, he had a very attractive secretary. And she was in her by herself. And when I walked in that office and she was by herself, I think I scared her some. And I, it was a shame that we have to live like that, but we do. I don't blame her. But I wrote him a note and asked him if he had any roots in Webster County to let me know. I never heard from him. But I, I want to get back up there and try to run that down. I found that my great I guess great 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 grandmother was born in Georgia. Uh, she she was married to Nathaniel. He was born in North Carolina. Do you know what section of Georgia? No. Do you remember her name? Uh, I got it at the house. I don't remember it. Uh, I'm going to go out to the Mormon Church one of these days. I called the guy the other day. They they've got that stuff nailed. Boy, I'm telling you. Great Grandpa John was born in Tennessee, and uh, I used one of those bountiful youth called analysis of I guess with 1820 census to uh, locate. It was in, from Tennessee to, to locate them, but uh, I haven't. I've got the time to do it. I sit around the house and don't do a damn thing for hours at a time. But I really need to get over to the university. They've got the census all the way back there. They've got them in this collection as well. But only in Georgia. That's a fact. Yeah. See, i got to go to Carolina and Tennessee now. Uh, it would do me some good with my one great-great-great-grandmother, uh, but then I could do that here. But uh, And I've seen over at the university that book that, that said Nathaniel Kelly in Tennessee, and I guess that was 1820 maybe, I don't know. See, if you go back beyond, I guess it's 1850, and they don't list all the children. They just list the, if it's a family, the parent, it's the parents, and then they give the children by age, but not by name. But along 40 or 50 or 60, they start listing all of them. And, uh, I was having a heck of a time trying to figure out what went on, and then, 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 then I found out that John and William married Louisa and Annetta, which were brothers marrying sisters, so that confused the issue. Have you had a pretty good response to this? Yeah, yeah, I have. Um, as I say, I'm working for the next four weeks on it, but I've been working for more than five weeks, and I've done more than 60 interviews. That's and great. Um,